बोल सकें तो बहुत बढ़िया रहेगा लेकिन नहीं तो आ, आ, जो 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 प्रेरणा दायक स्त्रोत्र या श्लोक हो जी जी तो उससे हम शुरुआत कर सकते हैं जी आ, मैं भगवत पाद शंकराचार्य का षटपदी स्त्रोत्र है उसके कुछ पद्य मैं पढ़ूंगा लेकिन उसके पहले सरस्वती वंदना का एक श्लोक अनुष्टुप या दुग्धा न दुग्धेव कवि दुग्धिन्वहम सन्निधत्ता सा सुखिधेनु सरस्वती अविनयमपनय विष्णुदमय मन शमय विषय मृग तृष्णा भूतदयाम विस्तार तारय संसार सागर दिव्य धुनी मकर परिमल परिभोग सच्चिदानंदे श्रीपति पदार विंदे भव भय खेद छिदे वंदे सत्य पिभेदापगमे नाथ तवाहम नमाम की नव सामुद्रोहि तरंग क्वचन समुद्रो न तारंग उधृत नग नग भीतनुज दनुज कुला मित्र मित्र शशि दृष्टे दृष्टे भवति प्रभवति न भवति किम भवति रस्कार धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद बलराम जी बहुत अच्छा लगा इस तरह से हम शुभ शुरुआत कर रहे हैं शुभारंभ कर रहे हैं वेलकम एवरीवन एंड वी आर डिलाइटेड टू डू दिस सिंपोजियम ऑन इंडियन हिस्ट्री और आदर हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडियन थ्योरी मेथड्स एंड प्रैक्टिस इन कोलैबोरेशन विद द शॉनी स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी ओहायो एंड द मूविंग स्पिरिट बिहाइंड दिस इज एक्चुअली प्रोफेसर lavanya vemsani who will uh, speak shortly after i finish thank you lavanya ji uh, for organizing this Badiya, uh, wonderful you. symposium and uh, uh, everyone welcome i wanted to say that we designed this in two parts so this would be the first part where we discuss what we might call itihas mimamsa you know in other words we may have a deeper reflection on the meaning of history in our time its methods its key its practice and follow it up with actually you know a sort of workshop where we can identify specific uh, you know even textbooks which need a revision because there's been a lot of discussion on textbooks not only in india as we know but also abroad and the california textbook case is very famous but in india there's a great deal of unhappiness some of our textbooks so we can come to that at the end but as i said we designed this in two parts and the first part was to open up the field for a deeper reflection on our, what we mean by history in our times and i'm happy to say that while we were uh, you know actually going about this conference the ugc has also put out a document called uh, i think they call it learning outcome based curriculum framework locf for ba history now i'm very skeptical of these you know jargon type of things learning outcome based curriculum framework blah blah but obviously we have to look at the contents and there's a tremendous shift in the aims of our undergraduate history syllabi now if you look at this document which i have very you know cursorily glance through but it some first talk about perhaps in our open session what i'm trying to say is it's an exciting time to be discussing history in india today uh, because there's a huge churn and there's also a demand for some parents as far away as uh, you know i got a mail this morning uh from uh, a friend uh, medha kerji who is a grandmother and she wrote me a mail she's uh, in chicago illinois we've exchanged a few mails earlier and she's identified like oh, thought 
<laughs> what you call tons of distortions in our history books. The written multiple email and left to the Shiksha Mantrale, the education ministry, in the past and has got no response. So the website says, and your feedback. So I'm saying that it's exciting time, the churn going on right now. And I just wanted to, uh, you know, just show you uh, two of the recent books that have come out, which, uh, you know, just indicate a kind of uh, uh, excitement in this domain that we broadly call history, you know. All kinds of new books have come out. One, uh, I'll show you that in a moment. It's by our own, one of our past fellows. It's a history of the Chipko movement. It's written in Hindi, Hari Bhari. Uh, I think, let me just get it. Give me just one second. I'll, I'll just bring the book for you. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it's called, uh, yes, Hari Bhari Umid. And uh, another book I wanted to show you by another one of our fellows. Uh, so this book is by Shekhar Pathakji who is himself uh, very much a part of the Chipko movement. He's a professor, he's an environmentalist. Uh, here's the book. Uh, and it's a very substantial book, Hari uh, Bhari Umid. So, so it's, a, it's about 600 pages. Uh, here's another book, uh, which is actually an, an English translation of a book by Professor Ada. Uh, it's called uh, it's called Mira versus Mira, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's actually of his of his book in Hindi <coughs> on Mira. And uh, here's another book on the Sapru House. You see uh, where the India the world affair started. I think in the late 40s, 46, if I'm not mistaken, and I remember. Jawaharlal Nehru was behind it. Sarojini Naidu gave a, a lecture uh, about Asian unity there. So this is, and it's it's still a very important institution, uh, Sapru House and the Indian Council of World Affairs. Here's another book. It's a it's a history of a train that was an account of a train that was built in India. Uh, it was called Train 18. You know, <laughs> India's first so-called super fast train. Unfortunately, it's been scrapped. Uh, then here's an institutional history of the RSS by Ratan Sharda. It's called Evolution from an Organization to a Movement. Then here's a more popular account of Battles of the Maratha Empire by Anish Gokhale. Then here we have another book, Splendors of Royal Mysore. The Untold Story of the Wadiyar is by Vikram Sampath. It's a very fat book with lots and lots of material, almost 730 pages. So as I was saying, there's a churn going on and uh, history as a discipline. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm reminded of another. And by the way, all these books came out in the last couple of years. Okay, They're all absolutely new. And I'm reminded of another book that was published just, I think, last year, 2020. It's written by Dr. T.C. Raghavan, who was the DG of, uh, of ICPR, our former ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, and uh, it's called The History Men. And it's, it's a book about three historians. Uh, and it's, in a way, it's a very interesting contrast to Arun Sori's book, Eminent Historians, which was an expose of a particular school of Indian history writing and the kinds of funds they used up and what they did not produce at the end. But instead of eminent historians, here's a book which is called The History Men. And it's about three historians, Jadunath Sarkar, uh, Sardesai, and a man called, uh, I think, uh, Raghu, uh, uh, Raghuvan Singh. I think that's, this is a guy I didn't know much about. He was from a small princely state and uh, he became a very important historian of Malwa, of the Malwa region. Uh, so, uh, Raghubir Singh, sorry. So, Jagdakar, G.S. Sardesai, and Raghubir Singh. And in this book, I'm mentioning this because, you know, he tells you that uh, in the recent past, we've seen debates in India 
about history as a discipline, history as struggle, and history as heritage. So I think that these are the dimensions of the contemporary reflections of what we mean by history. And I'm very delighted that we have, uh, you know, really wonderful participants. I want to welcome our uh, keynote speaker, Professor Dilip Takravarti, and he sent his paper in, and uh, he quotes Lohia uh, in uh, his uh, paper. I'm going to that in a moment. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we have talked about schools of history in India, you know, the imperialist or the colonialist school, the nationalist school, the Cambridge school, you know, the Annals school, uh, maybe the subaltern school. And now we are talking about the Hindutva school. I don't think people have branded it that as yet, but it's something that is emerging and it's reflected. It's uh, ideological, uh, you might say, predilections are reflected in this UGC document as well. But, you know, who are the founders or who are the founding fathers or mothers or, uh, you know, who are the, apart from the usual suspects like Savarkar, and I'm going to mention his book, The Indian War of Independence. But who are the founders of the so-called Hindutva uh, School of uh, History? And if you look at what Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia, who was, you know, Nehru's most vocal and prominent critic in the Lok Sabha and a socialist, look at what he writes on the UNESCO volume titled Prehistory and the Beginnings of Civilization. Dr. Lohia says, the errors that I'm going to point out in this book may not at the outset seem very important, but misunderstanding of Indian history by writers within and outside the country is so great that I shall try to explain its significance with a number of examples. Firstly, it is supposed that whatever occurs in India must be imitation of some other country or civilization, you know, and the strange part, and then he, I skip a little bit, and he says this, uh, supposition was challenged by, not by any Indian, not even by Dr. Radhakrishnan, our founder, who was also our ambassador to UNESCO, but by a, by a Russian historian called Ilian, Professor Ilian, familiar with his work. But, but uh, 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 you know, so he does not challenge these portrayals of ourselves, you know, which come to us, you know, by and large, uh, from our former colonial masters. And uh, uh, then he goes on to list a number of uh, difficulties or problems with the way Indian history is written. So I'm not going to be a spoiler for you. Professor Chakravarti will present his own work. Uh, but who are the founders of the Hindutva school? Well, they're not necessarily, you know, right-wing people associated with the uh, Rashtra. They are a whole host of Indians who were deeply concerned with the way we were portrayed, both to the world and to ourselves. And uh, such people certainly include Gandhiji too. If you read his Hind Swaraj, he has a whole section on how our history has been written. So uh, uh, even if you don't want to call it the Hindutva school of history, you may want to call it some other school because we already know what we mean by nationalist school. Uh, I think there's a lot to be discussed in terms of nomenclature. But this corrective turn in our self-representation is what I'm trying to highlight for us today. But, uh, but you see, the thing that I was trying to sketch out in my own reflections or my own mamsa are, on the one hand, we can think about Indian history in terms of schools. And often there's a notion that the schools are successive, that one school supplants the other. Like you might say the national was overtaken and supplanted by the Marxist school. And the Marxist school by maybe the subaltern school. And now that subaltern Marxist turn has been pushed aside by the Hindutva school. I don't quite think about it as a chronological succession in which one supersedes the other. I think all of these are present within us. So the framework which We've got in the history men by Professor, uh, by Dr. Raghavan, you know, all the three things, history as a discipline, what it means, history as a struggle, what that means, and heritage. 
think all these three coexist. One doesn't support the other. All these different schools with their different, I would say, orientations are still present in the way in which we do history. And at the same time, we have today matteries, gigantic micro and macro histories, histories of humankind, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, I mean, one of the names I can think of is uh, this Israeli, uh, you know, writer, thinker, um, Harari, you see, if you look at uh, Harari's books, uh, you know, they are uh, mega histories, you know. Uh, uh, he's written the history of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, I'm talking about Yuval Noah Harari. He's written Sapiens, a brief history of humankind. Another book he's written, if I'm not mistaken, it's called 21st, 21, 21 Lessons for the 21st. So, in a way, he's writing like mega histories. And then at the other end, you've got you know, not just subaltern histories, but really micro histories, histories of trains, histories of buildings, histories of institutions and so forth. So what I'm saying is this is an exciting time in India to, to reflect on the meaning of history. Uh, and uh, I think that this, I hope that this symposium will be a, a way to reignite uh, some of these debates. I just wanted to, you know, uh, uh, say a few words uh, on uh, things that I don't think people have, you know, paid a great deal of attention to, as far as I know, which is just the etymology of the word history. Uh, from what we gather, I mean, I was reading Herodotus for the last two, three days, and uh, we are told that it's he who first used the word history. So I was looking at uh, what Herodotus meant by history, and in his proem, Proem is like a, a kind of a preface or a prolego mena. Uh, and he says what follows is a performance. It's a performance. History for him was a performance of the inquiries. Inquiry is a translation of the word history, by the way. But I, I want to translate it differently. Of Herodotus from Helicarnassus. Uh, this is the translation of Gould. And uh, it implies that it implies that history was performative and read out uh, in, in those days. And, and this is what he says, human events do not fade with time. May the great and wonderful deeds, some brought forth by the heavy, others by the barbarians, not go unsung, as well as the causes that led them to make war on each other. So this is what Herodotus said. And if you look at the uh, standard uh, etymology of the word uh, uh, history uh, in a standard dictionary. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know how many people have actually noticed this, uh, that, the, that the word uh, history comes from uh, histor, histor, which is considered a learned or a wise man, but and of course, the, they, they take the etymology towards German and from the Dutch Wetten and the German Wiesen. That's how you get Wiesenschaft. Uh, but actually, the, the cognate word is wit. So one etymology of history actually leads to wit. Wit is a cognate of wit. To know. And wit is how we have to know. So in a sense, history is a kind of Veda. And if you go to Itihas, Itihas is a Pancham Veda. I'll just read out something in a moment. But the other thing, which I don't, I don't, I don't know if anyone has gone that route, but history, histor, is actually Hotar, you know, Hotar. Hotar, the priest, the one who praises, the one who sings the glories of heroes or God. The sacrificer, and how can you forget the very first Rick of the Agnine Purohitam Yagyasya Deva Yagyasya Deva Mrit Deva 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 Yagyasya Deva Vijam Mrit Vijam Deva Rit Vijam. 
ऋत्विजम होतारम रत्न धातमम तो दिस इज दैट होतारम व्हिच कम्स इन द वेरी फर्स्ट रे ऑफ द ऋग्वेदा वेयर ही सेज आई प्रेज इळे अग्नि यू नो द गॉड ऑफ फायर हु इज द प्रीस्ट पुरोहितम अग्नि मिळे पुरोहितम यज्ञस्य Uh, I've got another one which makes it easier for me to read somewhere, where it's broken down. Uh, but ah, ah, the Yajna Devam Ritvijam. I think that Devam Ritvijam, right? Ah, uh, Balramji Devam Ritvijam. Devam Rit. Yajna Devam Ritvijam. Ah, Yajna Devam Ritvijam. Hotaram Ratna Dhatamam. एंड फिर अग्नि पूर्वे फिर सो ये पुराने भी है और नए भी है सो वट आई एम हिस्ट्री इज लिंक टू प्रेज इन द प्रेज एटलीस्ट इन द इंडो यूरोपियन ट्रेडिशन एंड ऑफ दिस यू नो वॉट हैज बिन रिटन अबाउट वॉट वी कॉल श्रवस अक्षतम यू नो श्रवस which which is which is links no uh, uh you know, in uh, about this it started up in the 18th century uh you know everlasting pray uh, praise it's it's the same expression it's a it's a formula of great antiquity playos theton playos aspeton that is the great formula in homer playos aspeton which is similar to what we have in the rigveda ravas akshitam imperishable glory jiska koi kshay nahi hai you know so shreya jiska koi nahi hai so glory everlasting you know which was considered the aim of human life you know in a way to exceed the limitations of our uh being human and the chronicle of the deeds of those who did it you know so cleos of the com uh aspeton now all of this makes sense if you reflect on it deeply that's why i wanted to call it itihas mimamsa because who is the muse of history the romans called it cleo but for greeks it was cleos you know and cleos means you know praise it means singing uh you know stuti you know so that is what the hotaram does that is what the so to speak uh ancient itihas uh was actually uh that and uh, uh uh you know if if you see if you see what monier william says itihas he says is you know uh, so it was so indeed it was and it means stock legend tradition history accounts of former events and let's not forget heroism heroic history look at apte apte also mentions the mahabharat heroic history such as the mahabharat historic evidence which is recognized as proof by the puranikas uh, and uh, this is from apte but if you really reflect on it itihas is kind of literature and it is repeatedly mentioned along with purana so itihas purana are toggled as a as a uh, you know uh, uh, you know together itihas puran and of course they are you know coextensive uh, with the vedas itihas puran ved itihas puran as it were form one continuum of i would say ways of understanding ourselves and our lives and uh, you know our time on earth uh, and you know atharva ved you have the word itihas it comes in the shatapata brahman i did some research here and uh, it is clearly mentioned in the chandogya upanishad that puranas make up the fifth veda so there you are so the pancham veda formula applies to uh, itihas puran as to the mahabharat it applies to the natya shastra it applies to the veda and uh, by the point i'm trying to make is that uh, you know it interconnects with an impulse very deep seated in indian civilization
And this goes counter to the notions of imperial histori historians that Indians had no history, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea that we are ahistorical is a huge debate. I don't want to go into it. Uh, and uh, we would simply say, you know, there are different meanings of what uh, denote by the word history. You know, for example, if someone were to ask the fact that that uh, uh, Hanumanji jumped across, uh, you know, the Park Strait and landed in in uh, in in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And you see, by modern standards, it's not a fact. Obviously, it's not a historic fact in the modern sense of the word, but it is a poetic fact. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that we really the debate or the struggle over history is over what we mean by fact. And uh, when I was, uh, when I was, the year I was born in 1960, E.H. Carr, who was not a trained historian, was writing those six essays which made up the lectures that he gave at Cambridge called What is History? And when I was a young undergraduate at, uh, at St. Stephen's, one of the big events, you know, in the very first year of our, uh, of my undergraduate uh, college years. And I wasn't studying history, I must say, right at the beginning, uh, historians are more organized than me. I'm a bit rapid, a few points to make, uh, which I'm going to conclude very shortly. But I remember Brahmila Thapar came and she gave this lecture, you know, on, uh, on history. And, uh, you know, after the lecture, Somebody told me, and I raised a question, I'm going to come to that question also. The famous book, E.H. Carr, What is History, 1961, this late 70s was still, in a way, dominating how Indian historians were thinking about history. And E.H. Carr said that facts about the past and historical facts are totally different things. History is made up of historical facts, that is, facts that historians deem important. And in a way, Ramila Thapa's discourse, which I still remember very clearly, went along these lines, but she really talked about methods, that history is actually about methods. In other words, whatever the protocol of the discipline of history considers as a valid fact. And then she mentioned some epigraphy, archaeology, evidence is a bit dodgy, philological evidence is dodgy. So she was giving the list of documents or the list of, you know, what you might call the, uh, that passed the epistemological test of history, considered and organized in a particular way are considered this. But what E.H. Carr admits is who organizes this and with what intent, with what ideology, is what makes, you know, that person, uh, uh, you know, subject subjective or whatever intervention or that's the way that person ends up influencing history or schools end up influencing history and uh, you know if you read uh, if you read uh, marx marx wrote about the the great indian revolt uh, in fact in 1950 uh, sorry 1858 uh, you know his account was uh, uh, published and uh, uh, if you, if you look at if you look at uh, what he says there, he he notes on Indian history 1850. It was actually published by the Soviets. You see, in those days of the Cold War, and again in college I came across this book. And what does he do? He he lists all the invaders, invader after invader after invader. Precisely the point that he picked up in the UNESCO history of India. So this person that India but the palace what Nehru's discovery of India is an idea that came from Marx. It is only an account. Indian history is nothing but a chronicle of invasion, you know. Whereas here's another way that Indian history or ancient history, even of the Greeks, of the Indo-European people, actually an account of the valorous deeds of their heroes which were meant to say something, illustrate something, which were meant to teach something, you know? So here you see, uh, 
uh, where we come, I mean, we are now coming to Mill, obviously James Mill and the history of British India, uh, which nobody reads nowadays. I was teaching uh, for many years uh, research methodology in the English department of JNU, and I made people read it. It's too voluminous. Nobody can read it. And it's voluminous, so voluminous, because uh, he never, I think James Mill didn't want to finish it. It was a very good living, 800 pounds a year with the, which the East India Company paid him to start this history sometime in, uh, in I think, 1800 and uh, maybe, you know, six. And uh, he finished this history, I think, in 1817. Uh, 1800 and he began. He never visited India. In fact, the first part of this book is a tremendously important, you know, uh, I think, document on historiography. You know, and uh, instead of seven years, he finished it. I mean, he took 11 years and he retired on a pension of 2,000 pounds. I think if you, you know, see the inflation, this comes to a very tidy sum today, which most academics can't dream of earning in today's money, uh, in today's uh, currency. So, uh, uh, you know, and uh, what did Mill say? Mill, in my view, like Hegel, said that, Indians were somehow deficient in their cognition because they could not understand what a fact was and could not distinguish a fact and a myth. Well, you read Herodotus, you can't distinguish between facts and myths. You read Kalhana, you can't distinguish between facts and myths from a modern sense of the word. Myth, superstition, legend, fact. In these ancient or older accounts, in fact, in European accounts, you look at I've looked at the European travelers' uh, accounts of India, and before the 18th or 19th century, you can't distinguish which is, I mean, facts and fiction, facts and fantasy, facts and invention, facts and myths, mythos and logos are all mixed up. So, in a way, this distinction, this epistemic rupture between legend and history, between itihasa, and history. This is very recent, and it's tied up with the weaponization, you know, with the cart with the cartographic colonization of the world, and the invasion of the knowledge systems of the modern West to all corners of the globe, and they're imposing their own epistemology on all of them. When Tim was writing in the beginning of the Oh gosh, we are people without history, and without history cannot become a nation. So in the 19th century, there was a symbol for history in India. Everybody was trying to get in. By that, I mean Indians were trying to uh, get in as late entrants in a discourse from which they were excluded or they were written up by people like Mill, who is extremely negative portrait of Indian history religion, character, literature, art, then became the foundation for other views of India by people like Macaulay. And uh, of course, in terms of historiographical assumptions or historiography methodology, what did Mill say? You don't have to go to India. He, he wrote in London. He says, uh, you don't have to learn Indian language and no field work is required. Historical method for him was distant from what you want to describe in order to create reliable knowledge. And uh, in that sense, uh, this sort of uh, history from the academy, as opposed to history from the field, or history from a closet, if you like, would be, you know, uh, an old day to go to Mill. But it is Mill who sets up this entire template of Indian especially Hindus, is backward, superstitious, ignorant, you know, sati, they mistreat women, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they worship monsters, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And it sets up this whole sort of Orientalist, you know, paradigm of, of, uh, of how, uh, or what you may call the, the colonialist discourse of Indian history, and, the, and you might say the Western Indophobia, you know, and hostility 
which still persists in crisis reporting, in uh, in 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 uh, a fascination for the macabre, where you show burning piles of COVID deaths. So you know uh, the the mendacity and sincerity of Hindus, all these things continue. And you have similar stereotypical images of uh, the, the the Islamic rulers of the Ottomans, of the Persians later, of the Mughal as luxurious, given to pleasure, despotic, cruel, and so on. So these stereotypes uh, are very evident in, in James Mill, which is a, a very important uh, landmark for us to to, to consider. But uh, I want to end now by, by remembering a, a wonderful novel that Bhudev Mukhopadhyay wrote. It was, it's called Swapna Labdher Bharatiya Itihas, you know. Uh, I think that's the title, if I remember it, if I remember it right. Swapna Labdher Bhar Bharat Swapna Labdha Swapna Labdha Bharatir Itiha. So, in other words, you couldn't write a history of India in the 19th century easily because you were not trained, you didn't have the tools, you didn't quite know what history itself meant, what was valid knowledge uh, in terms of the protocols of the West. So, you could only conceive of an Indian history as a novel, you know, Upanyas. Uh, in a uh, conceived of in a dream, it became an imaginary history of India, and uh, uh, in other words, to reimagine India became uh, an important task uh, of of Indian uh, historians. And let me end. Let me end uh, uh, by by looking at uh, what uh, what Savarkar said in his uh, um, in his. Uh, uh, Indian War of Independence. Uh, he said, he said that it's very interesting that this book was published in 1907, the same year that Hind Swaraj, uh, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, Hind Swaraj was published in 1909, but I think Tavarkar wrote this in Marathi 1907. 1909, it was translated and published in English. VVS Ayer was one of the translators, and it was smuggled to a box of Pickwick Papers. The cover was Pickwick Papers, and it was in War of Independence, and it came to the Netherlands. It was shipped via the Netherlands. So you can see that there's a very interesting dialogue on the meaning of history that is going on between Gandhi's Hind Swaraj. In Gandhi's Hind Swaraj, he says, I'll quote one sentence from Gandhiji. And he says that uh, 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 it is therefore necessary to know what history means. The Gujarati equivalent means it so happened. He uses the word itihas in Gujarati. If that is the meaning of history, it is possible to give copious evidence. But if it means the doings of kings and emperors, there can be no evidence of sole force of passive resistance in such a history. Passive resistance is using the word satyagraha. You cannot expect silver ore in a tin mine. History as we know it is a record of the wars of the world. And so there is a proverb among Englishmen that a nation which has no history, that is no wars, is a happy nation. Now let's look at what Tavarkar said around the same time. Of course, Gandhi was not writing a book of history in Swaraj at all. But he has a view of what history is. And uh, it's interesting, in 1939, if you look at R.C. Mojumdar's address at the Indian History Congress, he says that, you know, the Congress view of history is a history of the non-violent, uh, is a history of non-violence. You know? So it's very interesting how this Gandhian view that there's no history of nonviolence because it's practiced in everyday life. And history is only a record of wars and battles. And let's quote what R.C. Muzumdar says in a minute. But here's what Savarkar says. But without, I'm quoting him, without an exposition of the hidden causes and the mysterious forces that work beneath the sense of a revolution, 
uh, that worked beneath, the essence of a revolution can never be made plain. And therefore, it is that history attaches more importance to the exposition of principles than the mere narrative. While searching after principles, historians oft often commit another mistake. For every act, there are various causes, direct and indirect, general and particular. But what is fundamental principle? This is what Savarkar is asking. When you organize the narrative, when you organize historical, when you root, when you look for root causes, then you should look for the fundamental principle. And this is what he gives in his introductory chapter in his book. He says the fundamental principle of his own history of the Indian, Indian War of Independence, or what he thinks caused the Indian War of Independence. The fundamental principles are Swadharma and Swaraj. And here you see an amazing unintended dialogue between Gandhi. Gandhi and Savarkar. And I would say the Hindutva school of history, if ever such a school is going to come up, should be, as it were, informed. I mean, what are the informing principles of the Hindutva school of history? I think that if you go by Gandhi and Savarkar, they should be Swadharma and Swaraj. The discovery of Swadharma and Swaraj in the chronicles of the past would be, as it were, you know, a defining idea, if not ideology, for a new history of ourselves, of India. And, uh, uh, I think uh, I've spoken much longer than I ought to have. But as I said, this is an informal, it's a mimamsa, right? So we will adjust a little bit uh, in our own uh, reflection. So we who have been a people without history have now suddenly been interpolated into history into modernity. And what kind of histories are we going to write? Not imitation histories of Western, I think, historians and uh, or, you know, subaltern. The subaltern school was a kind of Indian invention if you read Ranajit Kuha. Again, it's a matter of methodology how you read the document. It's hermeneutics. I'm also saying history is hermeneutics because I don't know what a fact is, you know, frankly. At least I don't know what the fact. And I think that there's room for uh, all kinds of facts, six facts, uh, facts, poetic uh, facts, uh, you know, a, a traditional glorification, reyas, akshitam, that is history. Also, as we now see modern histories very competently written based on archaeological, epi epigrammatic and epigraphs, other, you know, documents written and oral. And I remember, uh, you know, just to wind up, I remember this question that came up. I asked uh, uh, Romila Thapa this question that uh, with these protocols, you will expect different kinds of history. And this is what uh, Minakshi Jain wrote in her review of medieval history textbooks how they exclude 12 dynasties from Kashmir, though we have records in Kalhana, to the south. All these dynasties are wiped out in Satish Chandra's history. So, a different kind of question. I said, your protocols will exclude certain things, right? What about cultural memory? She said, well, that's not history. But the time has come to write histories which take into account not just what are considered historical facts by eminent and not so eminent historians governed by the protocols of the discipline of history. Yes, we need that. There's no need to abuse and troll and uh, mock professional historians, academic historians. We must respect them and make conditions available to them so that very competent histories keep being written in India. Academic histories, professional histories, histories which pass muster, you know, by the of knowledge-producing systems. We 
who are not people of history, as Raja Rao said. We should also write Itihasa. Raja Rao uh, wrote a wonderful book, which is, uh, give me one laugh, go and tell. So this is a Puranic, this is a Puranic account of Mahatma Gandhi. It's a Gandhi Puran of a sort. It's called Mahatma Gandhi, The Great Indian Way. I've written a long introduction. And, and Raja Rao, we'll have time for this later. I'll come back on to this later. But Raja Rao talks about, uh, you know, how to understand India. And he says, you can't understand in India by conventional histories. You need a new idiom. You need a new narrative. And he says, only a Puranic imagination can comprehend India. I'll read that section later. And he writes the Gandhi Puran. But the thing I wanted to say is there's not one factual error in this. All the facts are there. You know, whatever is known in his own autobiography and by in Tendulkar, it's a deeply researched book. All the facts are there, but they're told in a completely different manner. They're told in the manner of a prana, of an itihasa, in terms of Shreyas Aksitam and with the Purusharthas, ultimately. It's, it's a narrative which takes us towards moksha, towards a whole civilization self-discovery, you see? So what I'm trying to say is that uh, a heterogeneity, you know, and a heterogeneity to mark uh, this field of historiography in India today. We need all kinds of histories, professional, professional, legends, account, new Puranas like, like Raja Rao's, uh, and uh, histories of, you know, Swadharma and Swaraj. Thank you so much. With these words, I hand it over to Lavanya ji. Uh, sorry, I've, I've taken too much time, but as I said, we have some flexibility, and I think we can listen to each other and uh, and uh, go deeply into some of these questions. Go ahead, Lavanya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Makran Pranjpe. You haven't taken in uh, time, you know, you, you have actually given us very, very good introduction. Uh, you have surveyed the etymology and the beginnings of history and then how we can find a continuum of history beginning with the, uh, with Vedas and uh, how it goes it, with Itihas and Puranas and, you know, and you also surveyed. Uh, you gave a great survey of how Indian history writing begins with uh, James Mill and Marx, and then uh, you also discussed uh, Indian uh, um, scholars, Gandhi, Savarkar. Uh, so this this gives us a very very good introduction uh, as we go into as we are uh, immersing ourselves into uh, understanding history and what should be done. Uh, uh, as we proceed uh, with uh, finding our true history. Um, so uh, as, as noted, uh, it's a churn, uh, it's happening. Uh, it, it, it needed to be done. Uh, it's already late, uh, but at least we are starting to do it. So which is, which is a good sign. So uh, thank you, Professor Paranjpe. Um, namaste everyone. Uh, my thanks to our distinguished speakers and participants today. Uh, I will begin uh, by outlining some of the concerns plaguing Indian history and introducing subjects of discussion in this two-day international symposium jointly organized by the Indian Institute of Advanced Study uh, and Shani State University. Um, as as Professor Paranjpe has already discussed, uh, the colonial beginnings have uh, placed our history in a, in a, in a very, um, very non-historical uh, manner. History is preserved uh, in the activities of the people. These activities are frequently preserved in the literary and archaeological sources of the uh, of the country to which they belong where they live uh, for example if we are writing indian history we should be recording the activities of the people living uh, and the people's record uh, preserved in literary and archaeological sources but 
in the case of India, uh, activities of its residents uh, were overlooked in favor of baseless theories and constructed personalist histories. Uh, why doesn't Indian history represent the trials and triumphs uh, of the people of India? The artificial theories that frame it show that it began and influenced by foreign invaders. It always appears to recollect the histories of some folks who appeared out of the blue from nowhere, uh, but nonetheless, imperialist history presents that they unwittingly affected the history of India. The beginnings of India are obliterated by such theories of exalted, non-existent invaders and migrants. This is the result of colonialist, imperialist uh, machinations perpetrated for close to a century in preparation to control all things concerning India, including its history. India's treasures and wealth are stolen, and India is denied her true history and identity as India is left as a hollowed shell because of all these construed theories, all these imaginary theories. The primary goal of colonialist imperialist machinations is canceling indi indigenous civilization. This happened in all the colonized societies. Indigenous societies are completely occupied and compelled to learn and move away from their own native histories and religions. They were altered through introducing new racial theories under the rules of writing history and sociology, which introduced alien racial theories which drastically altered the long-standing history of many societies, leaving them rootless and voiceless in the process. Indian religion is called no religion or no name religion, while being perfectly aware that classical historical societies of the world do not refer to themselves or their religion with a distinct name. That name was only used by the outsiders, using distinct name for religious practice by, by the people becomes common with the arrival of missionary religions, beginning with Buddhism. For example, ancient religions of the world, including Egyptian and Greek religions, are all known by the name of the civilization. They are not called by a different distinct name for religion. India and everything that belongs to India is also similarly known by the same name. Uh, such as Hindu or Hindu for the people, Indoi or Hindoi for the religion, uh, and for the land, India or Indica. Uh, the name is also okay. used to reverse ocean, and uh, it's also used for the desert that surrounds India. So, so whatever theories that were proposed uh, were proposed with an agenda-driven uh, conscious to. Uh, to distort the history of India. Uh, volumes of books were written arguing that India was not the name of India or Hinduism is not the religion. Large section of scholarship is dedicated to arguing Hinduism is not the religion what it was known to be, or it's not the oldest religion as it's known to be. Unfortunately, they forget the fact that lack of availability of a specific name does not negate the existence of a practice. A large section of scholars uh, still dedicate uh, to perpetrating this stereotypical portrayal of Hinduism in India. They also invent names to separate early phase of Hinduism from classical Hinduism. Selective interpretation of the facts and omissions are notable here. The early phase of Indian history needs to be based on the early sources of India, not some imaginary theories. So by denying the existence of uh, Hinduism, by denying the existing existence of historical memory, uh, the historians are actually constructing that Indian history abruptly began later, not, not as it began um, in, as we know from our texts and from our cultural sources. Scholars agree that language morphology contributes to understand the relationship between different groups of languages but it is not the ultimate tool to understand chronology or ethnicity of a society. Its contribution to understanding race and historical origins are limited. It only provides conjectures at best. Even then, the misconstrued Aryan invasion theory is used to confuse historical beginnings of India. Continued debates confused it more than cleared it. 
So instead of pinning our hopes on language morphology, which was used to propose Aryan theory, we should move beyond by proposing a new framework to understand India. Genetic history provides one such factual evidence. Genetic history places India as the founder's zone next to Africa. Populations of India only show continuity from the first foundations of anatomically modern humans about 80,000 years ago and shows no replacement or sudden increments. Aryan theory, if at all mentioned, it should only be mentioned as a theory, not as a historical fact representing a racial conquest and oppression, as it was made to be seen in earlier historical constructions. Much ink and time had been wasted by historians discussing this theory, which only left the field more confused. This one theory had off-tracked Indian history for close to a century. Indian historical writing began under the colonial government in the 19th century, uh, as Professor Paranjape has noted, uh, the, the company has actually uh, spent, the East India Company has spent immense amounts of money paying these scholars to create uh, the spurious histories, spurious theories of, of India. Uh, and these remained unchallenged for the past 100 years, even after the independence of India. Therefore, it is important to undertake a close examination of Indian history, questioning the colonial theoretical constructions and fragmentary nature of its history, questioning fragmentary nature of its past narratives for each major era and geographical region to bring out fact-based Indian history. In the 21st century, the shortcomings of earlier historical constructions are even more glaringly obvious in the light of the new data, as well as the previously omitted data of Indian history. Thus, the new approach helps break the stereotypical portrayal of India, which was originally based on a number of uh, conjectures, misconstrued racial theories, and more. Incorporating new evidence-based research brings forward comprehensive examination of India throughout its long history. India attained independence, but Indian intellectual tradition is still colonized. It is important to decolonize the intellectual tradition, especially important to bring out the true history of India. By really examining each aspect of Indian history, this could be done. For a country that prides itself on standing firm on truth as enshrined in the motto of the nation, uh, Satyamaya Jayate, this should be the least that needs to be done urgently uh, to impart truth and fact-based history uh, to the citizens of the nation. Theoretical frameworks are used to nail down India on an artificial framework, which almost function to hollow out India from inside as discussed here. It is inconsequential if those who participated in this imperial project knew it and contributed to buttressing this imperial project knowingly or unknowingly, as the result is the same, whether intentional or not, or not uh, it contributed to obliterate the sources, obliterate the history of India. Most of the early scholars who wrote these theories were funded by the East India Company, as noted. Once the theory is firmly entrenched, it found followers far and wide. It almost seemed as though this mythical race appearing from nowhere has appeared to have conquered the whole Indo-European world through intellectual dominance with this theory. Indian history as it stands currently lacks historical sensibility and standard historical methodology. Historical methodology demands that any historical event to be evaluated and accepted as historical fact, it needs to be supported or corroborated by at least two different separate comparably contemporary historical sources or evidence. However, this basic historical norm uh, is fluted more frequently than not to arrive at spurious theories such as the Aryan invasion or migration. But this is done more frequently in each era. Uh, these theories came to dominate Indian history subsequently, included as historical facts in Indian history. Obviously, assumptions and theoretical perspectives are not history. Uh, evidence must come from ground from concrete historical records, such as texts or stories. This is absent in the case of Aryans and in the case of preparation of Indian history uh, earlier. 
Indian history is understood uh, from a fixed geographical axis and the linearity imposed by the invasionalist bias. What happened in Indian history subsequently is to continue to interpret Indian history with this framework as if it had always been evolved and imposed from a northwestern axis through invasions and migrations. This ignores the ground reality of Indian history, which is multi-axial and long-standing and chronologically and civilizationally shifting. Hence, civilizational shifts within Indian history with different geographical nodes emerging and contributing at different points in time must be acknowledged and incorporated into Indian history. Shouldn't Indian history depict the progress as well as evolution based on its civilizational and cultural shifts? Why is this ignored? Uh, somebody was sending me some pictures of uh, textbooks, uh, which are um, too baseless to recollect here. Uh, they almost appear like a joke. Uh, so I have spoken about the issues with historiography with re regards to Indian history previously. However, it's not out of place to stress them here. Uh, the most primary method used to understand Indian history and religion could be called solving the puzzle. Uh, this, this just means that um, there is no clear evidence. Nobody has actually mentioned it, but some some historian or some uh, person who is paid heftily can sit down with Indian decks and come up with any theory that, that comes in their mind. Uh, this is how Aryan theory is developed. Uh, second and most important method uh, is to create theories and infuse and confuse uh, 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 history. And this, this can be called, uh, let's make up a theory and apply this theory. Uh, this is also used, uh, and I, I have to go back to RN theory. This fits so many uh, of the methods that were used. Another most important method commonly used to overinterpret uh, simple terms and impose never used uh, are newer meanings which are then used to confuse history and religion of India. Words such as bhakti are mis misinterpreted this way. Uh, bhakti, even though uh, it, it actually originates and closely relates to bhag, it is interpreted as buzz or boj, you know, it's uh, uh, confused a lot. Uh, similarly, uh, Aryan. Aryan is not a word. Uh, but it, it's made up to be a word, uh, made up to be a word from the Vedas uh, and a race. So um, uh, such, uh, semantic, such language exercises actually are used to, uh, to colonize people uh, normally. And another, uh, another theory, uh, which I call is um, spurious but commonly used. Uh, trope to impose their intuition. So, you know, this, this can be called, let me tell you about my, my intuitions. Uh, most of the classical stories of the epics are interpreted this way. Uh, and uh, Professor Paranjapi has noted this. Um, James Mill has said, uh, Indians are backward. They don't know the difference between uh, uh, fact or fiction. They lack uh, strength or mind to distinguish between fact or fiction. Uh, this type of uh, stereotypical uh, depictions come from this. Um, there is no evidence to prove that. They, they, all classical societies have um, histories preserved in uh, fantastic stories. Uh, but um, so, uh, histories are written uh, implicating Indians as backward, but not, not others. Uh, which is also a, a, another uh, colonial method uh, of uh, of subjugating the colonized subjects. Um, another method uh, is omission. This is an important one, uh, which dominated historical constructions in India. Important sources, including classical texts or archaeological sources, um, probably um, uh, Chakraborty, Professor Chakraborty might touch upon it. Uh, prehistoric sources were not used uh, to construct the beginnings of India. So how data is selectively interpreted also contributes 
to twisted understanding of historical India. To bring out clearer history of India, we should first clearly understand the stereotypical methodical portrayal of India, which the imperial history machinery has created. The frameworks need to be changed to arrive at a holistic understanding of India. My book on Indian history, slated for release later this year, discusses these issues and also attempts to provide more nuanced and broad-based history of India. Uh, in general, what needs to be done uh, for Indian history is, Indian subcontinent should be accepted uh, as a historical unit for understanding early history of India. Common aspects of Indian civilization are spread across the subcontinent. It is not unusual to find similarities in language and culture from northern reaches of the Himalayas to the southern tip of India, including the minor nations around India and the Indian Ocean. Even though numerous political states existed throughout Indian subcontinent, they functioned as a confederation of states, which allowed free travel of people and goods, uh, allowing trade and education and travel, pilgrimage, etc. Uh, and they also followed a similar culture with regional variations. It had been noted in Indian classical texts as well as the descriptions of travelers to India. Indian sources, be it archaeology, classical texts, and inscriptions, and oral texts should be consistently used to recover the lost history of India. With these questions in mind, we begin our current symposium. The current symposium uh, is History of India, Theory, Methods, and Practice, scheduled for today and tomorrow. This symposium examines the theory, methods, and practice of Indian history, noting the lacuna within the history of India, beginning with imperial history constructions. Lectures also focus on specialized areas of Indian history, archaeology, early history, second millennial history, focusing on Indo-Islamic history, art and monumental history, and anthropological and sociological history. These aspects of Indian history were only partially analyzed previously, hence needs complete examination. As India is nearing 75 years of independence, it is necessary to undertake a critical examination of Indian history. This symposium is organized to highlight the problems and propose solutions for understanding India. Guidance and support for this effort comes from Director of IIAS, Professor Makran Pranjbe, whose efforts in recovering Indian intellectual tradition and history are well known. Hence, I won't go into lengthy details here. Sessions of the two-day symposium are as follows. Professor Nalini Rao's lecture uh, discusses networks of power and interdisciplinary study. Uh, her focus is mostly on um, monuments and art history. Illustrious scholar and well-known archaeologist, Professor Dilip Chakraborty, uh, will be starting us on the right track by beginning the series of lectures with his keynote address, Aspects of Nationalism in Indian Archaeology. The first session is chaired by Professor Dilip Chakraborty, brings to us two illustrious speakers. Professor Sharadindu Mukherjee's lecture, was the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 urgently required? An inquiry into its historical necessity addresses the contemporary questions on citizenship with historical lens. Professor Venkata Ragotam's lecture, History and Culture of Indian People, the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan series and its critics addresses the questions on historical writings in India. The second session, chaired by Professor Rajbir Sharma, brings forward lecture on Indian nationalism under the British. Professor Dinyar Patel's lecture, Going Native, Alan Octavian Hume and the British Dimensions of Indian Nationalism, discusses Indian nationalism and the British. I will be chairing the third session, scheduled for the morning tomorrow, featuring two well-known scholars of Indian history. Professor Andrew Andre Wink uh, lectures on the making of Indo-Islamic world, 700 to 1800 CE, addresses the long span of second millennial history of India until the dawn of modernity. 
Professor Pankaj Jain's lecture, The Varna Jati and Caste System in Indian Society, addresses the sociological, anthropological, and historical and contemporary social understanding of India. Validatory session features the lecture of Professor Shnalika Kaul, discussing, uh, discussing the reconstructing Indian historiography, challenges, and opportunities. Sessions are followed by an hour of open uh, discussion session. The symposium concludes with my concluding remarks and vote of thanks. I will reserve my further remarks on Indian history to this last session. Thank you all. I welcome you all to participate in all the sessions and send your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Nalini Ji. I will introduce uh, Professor Nalini Ji and uh, we will proceed uh, for the next uh, lecture. Right. Uh, Professor Nalini Rao holds a PhD in art history from UCLA and another in ancient history and archaeology from the University of Mysore, India. Rao's specialization includes South and Southeast Asian art, ancient and modern. Presently, she is Associate Professor of World Art uh, in Soka University of America, California, USA. Her specialization is Indian history, art, religion, ancient and modern art and architecture. Rao is the author of many books, some of which include Hindu Monastery in South India, Social, Religious and Artistic Traditions, Sindhu and Saraswati Civilization, New Perspectives, Boundaries and Transformations, Sangama, Confluence of Art and Culture during the Vijayanagara uh, period. La Lavanya ji, La Lavanya ji. Uh -huh. I was just going to suggest that we don't have to read out these bios. In fact, uh, some uh, of our participants have complained that their bio note is all wrong. But all I'm trying to say is everybody is really famous and the schedule has been circulated. I think we should spend most of our time and energy in our discussions and reflections. And I'm also happy that we have plenty of time. This session is supposed to go on till 11.30. So uh -huh. in that sense, uh, I think we can uh, generally relax and take this forward. Thank you for your introductory remarks and those. I like the those template of, uh, should I say, you know, when we were uh, 100, 150 years ago, when Indians were learning English, they always had, you know, some frequently uh, 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 made mistakes by Indians. So similarly, you've given a template of frequently made mistakes by uh, historians of India. So that's going to be very useful when we uh, want to make any corrective. And as I said right at the beginning, I'm also happy to announce that the next session, the keynote session will be coordinated, chaired by uh, Professor Venkata Raghutam, uh, and who turns out to be a student of, uh, of uh, Professor Chakravarti. So it's, it's a wonderful coincidence. And I want to invite uh, uh, Professor Rao now, Professor Nalini Rao, you already introduced her. The only thing I wanted to say, some people still have their mics on, so they're getting a bit of background noise. And uh, something also seems to be the matter with our IIS uh, 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 network. So I've joined on a phone, but I think some of our fellows uh, may be a bit, uh, I don't know if they are joining us, if they can hear me. But these are, you know, this is the flip side of doing these things online across time zones. So once again, many, many thanks to everyone who's joined from the US, Canada, from Europe, uh, UK, everywhere, and from various parts of India. And thanks to you, Lavanyaji, for, uh, uh, you know, being our inspiration here. So uh, Professor Nalini Rao, all yours. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lavanya Ji and Paranj Ji for inviting me uh, to this webinar. Um, it's an honor to be here and to share my ideas with other such eminent historians uh, from India. <clears throat> and it is a great pleasure. I was particularly interested 
uh, in the insightful understanding of history that Dr. Paranjpe uh, narrated and what Dr. Lavanyaji told us about colonial history and her forthcoming book on that. However, I am a historian and an art historian. And I am I don't know where I belong. I grew up in India and studied in India, and now I'm here. And 99.9% .9 of my students are Westerners. And probably 0.001% is an Indian. Okay. And we are dealing with a, a set of students and society that does not know much on India or has misrepresentations. And as one who worked for the textbook issue that was there in California for past 10 years, I have gone through a lot trying to convince the California Board of Education how to remove these distorted and damaging theories, such as uh, the Aryan invasion theory. Secondly, yoga is slow breathing. Carly drinks blood is your religion. Caste, divide all children, divide yourself into caste. And it does not matter if the Brahmin cheats in the exam. So for 10 years, we waited the whole day and were given one minute to talk about what we had to say. And there were students from the sixth grade and the seventh grade and the eighth graders lined up for a whole day, each to talk for one minute. And this is how we organized ourselves to present to the editor board how to remove, why to do so, and what is the historical fact. And coming from European way of understanding to the American, and how academics is what sets the tone for this percolation into society. Okay. And it will set the tone in India as well. Ultimately, we sort of, we thought 80% was taken up, edited, and we had to struggle against Indians themselves. And that is very, very disappointing for those who want to bring up objective historical interpretation, okay, and use recent researches in the textbook because our children and grandchildren would come up and tell us, I do not want to be a Hindu, mommy. I, they tease me, are you married? Did you have a child marriage in India? So all these hundreds of questions affect our generation here. At the same time, okay, uh, I am very happy to see that history is going to be rewritten. But how unlike the Indian concept of history, this broad, comprehensive understanding of a huge, huge, massive topic is not the way that American historians of India write history. There are very few of them, extremely few. The way research is done is more into particular regions, particular communities, particular methods, method uh, using those and coming out with a set of general principles or analysis or generalizations that is put into a box called a theory. So this theory proceeds from a practice as such. When I first came here, and I, and I still teach that, I try to teach the students to come up with a theory, a theory not as something which is inflexible and rigid, but something that has the flexibility, but gives you, provides a quick understanding. So these terms, Okay. Um, I think it's important, instead of saying schools, schools, the nationalist school, or the Hindutva school, the theories of history, 
is the big question. So terminology um, uh, could be a point of discussion. However, I would like to now uh, enter into what I propose to do today, namely describe the art history method. Okay? And why art history? Well, I came from India to learn here, to learn what art history is. That was my only objective, how to write about art. It's not a question of language or description or perception or beauty of Indian arts. It was something much more. So here I will deal with the art historical method and try to give you some examples from the ancient and medieval periods, okay? Because the modern is something different. Um, and before I dwell into it, I would like to mention that Indian intellectual and humanistic ideas have gained great importance in the West today. I myself, although I'm not a religious specialist, teach a psycho uh, yoga and psychology. I teach the concept of self. And in my university, the first course that every student has to take for a month is about the self. And we begin with the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and the Katha Upanishad, and then proceed to Plato and, and Aristotle and, and um, other modern historians. So this concept of self, the concept of environment, the concept of community living, okay, that architecture fostered, has gained great importance here. And India is known for this. Um, so, uh, so who is it that determines what, what happened what were in history in regard to these ideas and principles and institutions and facts and, and concepts is the historian. So the historian reconstructs plays a very crucial role so that uh, there can be an objective interpretation. So it's a mode of inquiry. Okay. So in our school, we also uh, university, we also have modes of inquiry, the scientific mode, the historical mode, art historical mode, anthropological mode, sociological mode. So you know what you're going to get into as such. Um, uh, and the art historical mode is it's a very young discipline. It's a very recent discipline compared to the historical mode. And it brings us to the point as to what is art, whether it is beauty or whether it is, it is a style or it is just supposed to be in a museum and say how beautiful things are. It's a historical document after all. And it is studies a tangible, non object, non verbal language. And hence, it lends itself more to interpretation than does a historical document, such as a literary text or an inscription or archaeological. Uh, so, a lot, so if you compare these different disciplines, Art history uses two math modes, namely perception and interpretation. Now, perception or perceptive mode has to do with imagery and form and observation. What is the scale? What's the proportion of color, light, and the interpretive mode, but style does not cannot be an independent way of analysis. It does not stand by itself. It has to be put in a historical context within the space where it originated. And that is a historical context. And this interpretive aspect takes into account evidences, political, social, economic, using documents, just as any other historian does. So 
the so what we're looking at is in in india the oral tradition was a very important fact it was a fact so it's not necessarily facts with the documents but also oral tradition plays a great important role as such so there are different methods that are uh, pursued by art historians some of them might be biographical the biographical for ancient and medieval indian history is not important or doesn't exist since we did not know the name of the artist it is there for a modern indian art then you have a feminist art history history okay now uh, for example recently i gave a talk on 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 women in india and that has gained a lot of importance here every year every year one book on indian goddesses comes out which empowers the woman that she is a goddess right so the women's movement uses books on indian goddesses right uh, to empower themselves uh, about it so there's the feminist interpretation there is the psychological interpretation of art history there is the uh, iconographical interpretation which has been there for a long time in india and there is the marxist interpretation there is the semiotic and there is the iconological the iconological bakunovsky states that it has to do with meaning with taking into account events and rituals and ceremonies and intellectual thinking and philosophy so here we have some sort of um, a methodology that is used to help us expand the research topics of in indian art and one thing i have found is the topics of research in indian art have been almost the same for a long time whether it was from percy brown the same books are used there and new materials from here do not go database articles are not available there and the same things are repeated um, instead if universities were to inspire students to go and have a, a, a method to show them the method of, from a particular context they could expand the topics of research okay and come out with more analysis as such right however so all these methods being used they all use historical context or interdisciplinary and they all all art history is a social history or art does not just look at stones and bricks it looks at the people who created them okay. so for example i would like to give an example from vijayanagar okay a very popular place from south india from karnataka and share uh, thoughts about how i arrived at networks of power i will go to other examples if time permits uh, lavanya ji can i share the screen okay you have to do it yourself i think from your own machine yeah um i'm going to do it yes yes it's starting yeah there you go um so i'm going to click it again. i have it here can you see it can you see it yes it's opening up you can maximize it okay you can go to full screen mode if you like i yeah. think perfect okay thank you <clears throat> uh, so let me share a few aspects uh, about what i did um, 
regarding networks of power. Okay. As we all know, Vijayanagar, much has been written about this topic, the kingdom and the capital city of Hampi, and uh, by Mitchell or Fritz or Nagraj Rao, and analyzed this entire layout and plan of the city. Okay. And we have heard a lot about it from the accounts of Pays and Razak and foreign accounts. And there are numerous other sources, inscriptions and palaces uh, and temples and sculptures and so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, he normally divides this whole area that you see here uh, as, a, as a royal center uh, with its seven walls of fortification and within that the royal center. While in the north, it is divided as a sacred center, which sent a lot of, uh, of, of questions. So it began my whole analysis by looking at power and king's power um, and started identifying the images of kings. As we all know, there are very few images of kings on temples and very small. So. Why were they so small? And so what I had to do with, um, icono with the iconography of kings, okay, and how to identify them. And here at Vijayanagar, in one of the temples at Chutrayapura, in a small mandapa, were images of kings on the pillar, while one of them, one of the kings, you can see giving a gift to a Brahmin. In addition, apart from this, there is also was the stone balance or a tulabhara, where the king used to weigh himself in gold and precious stones and distribute to the temples and, and Brahmins. We also found in the excavations huge images of kings as well. As a question arose, um, so from there, simply power. If architecture was so humongous and magnanimous, while well, the sculptures are so small, what might be the reason? So all we began is by asking questions to architecture and sculpture. I mean, of course, they never talked back. <clears throat> but what was the role of the king? Okay. What was the role? of the temples and how did they interact with each other how were uh, the the really how were the what was the structure of the institution um, and was this an organization or was this uh, a random building since there was no architect you don't know the name of the architect as such okay. so we found that the king's role from inscriptions in other places was, of course, to give royal grants and to protect the people with fortresses and defense, provide water and collect taxes. But in the other part of the city, it was the temples. And these temples were temple cities. In front of every temple, there was a big bazaar street. These huge temple cities grew up and were a continuation of the Chola temple cities that we see or influenced by that. And they survived due to royal grants and from the elite. They got collected land and money. They became landowners, had industries, okay, used rituals to promote trade and markets grew around them and they employed people and expanded the economy. And what was the role of the market and why did it have to be in front, near the temples? Um, uh, as you know, the, the temple was the focus for the beginnings of a market okay, and, and which, and along these industries flourished, whether it's the blacksmith or the goldsmith or the weaver, all of these were organized in the guild system, 
there's lots of evidences in inscriptions if you see, look at the history of guilds. And they, these guild system not only helped the administration of the temple, not only built roads, they helped even the king, and they even collected their own taxes. So who was now in charge was the question. Was it the king? Was it the temple? Or was it the market? If you look at all these different built environment, yeah, see, then do we see the interaction or the structure of the institution in its architecture or conspicuous display of architecture? How can changes in architecture, I'm sorry, how can changes in architecture inform us about the changes in societal norms, societal values, societal principles, and ways of living. Uh, so after examining the number of royal images in the royal center, such as that on the Mahanomi Dibba and the Ramta temple, there were 24 images of kings that we found small images, okay? And as it's in a procession, witnessing the procession of Mahanomi, uh, and saw that the king was, uh, played a crucial role, okay? And it was because of his power, kingly power of gifting and liberalism that the temple survived. While the temples, the massive temples, which were uh, where the arts were enacted, where social gatherings took place, where teachings took place, here expanded the cultivable land indirectly, and the markets were there that expanded the economy. So there was an interaction between the three institutions which we now recognize in architecture. So here we have material substantiation of the principles and functions of an inst of institutions okay, uh, that operated in an immaterial way. Okay. Uh, however, all these institutions were also independent. And we see that independence by the walls that were erected between the temple puras, between the different sections of society. Uh, but at the same time, they cooperated okay, without any conflict. But what really set the tone of the city was this architecture, magnanimous architecture. So if our architecture had power in society, as it does today, because as we see the skyscrapers today, right? it, it impressed others, it regulated, it protected, okay, ceremonies took place, okay, and, but what was the degree of integration is the question. Uh, that I analyzed, um, it's a long uh, analysis, the liberalism, the liberal aspect of kingship, of kingly power, the religious aspect of power, the heroic aspect, the ritual aspect, and the dharmic aspect came up with these different aspects of kingly power that continued and changed according to times. So while literature did not provide, the text did not provide all the evidences, it is art history, it is art and architecture that shows how the people and the kings lived in a practical way, in a practical way. It tells us something that was practiced, okay, rather than something philosophical or just religious, whether it was practiced or not. So in that way, there is a difference. Of course, in the end, I will also talk to you about the difference in art and archaeology uh, later. If uh, Lawanji, is there more time for me? Is there more time for me? 
how long would you like to take? We thought we could also have a few questions. Uh, yeah, but, sure. Uh, just ten maybe, more minutes. Maybe just you can you can finish minutes. in another about ten minutes if yeah, you like. Definitely, definitely, yes. Another aspect that I would like to emphasize is, um, I, I mean, thing that I looked, um, researched on was the Jain monument in Sravanabel Gola. And as you know, we all know this massive image of Bahubali. And here I had, of course, and with all its temples and basides and pillars and funerary structures and caves and all that. But the question is, the question I was looking at, is what was the relation between sculpture and architecture between built and unbuilt environment, okay? And why was Bahubali was so massive in sculpture while the Tirthankara is always so small and within a closed uh, mandapa or bagarbagruha or a, a small shrine, okay? And of course, after reading all the Kannada literature that was written during that period and how they eulogized Bahubali, okay? And still, it was uh, it was not convincing. So, what is the theory or the principle of the Tirthankara as an index to living? But also, he was a Devadi Deva, and it was a ritual tradition, and where they could perform the ritual, where the rituals were not necessary for Bahubali as well. Um, so, this aspect was also revealed to me. Because in Artipura, where a recent excavation has been conducted, Bahubali is a small image on the top of the cave, while the Jai Tirthankaras is, are extremely small. All this is a monastic context. And I came to this Jai monastery from uh, looking, examining all Hindu monasteries, right, from Shaivite monasteries to, uh, uh, to Vedanta mon monasteries in South India. And came also looked at the icon or relic of the guru or the ascetic uh, called Vrindavana in Karnataka and all of South India, where there are hundreds and hundreds of relic worship that is take uh, that is uh, that is there, uh, uh, and no none nobody in the West knows about it. Uh, while it is so popular a uh, worship in India. So it is important that we, and, and my book has uh, recently come out as well. So, uh, so it is important that historians, Hindu historians write a very cohesive scholarly construction of particular areas and regions and communities of the past. Okay. Um, uh, so one of the questions that was asked to me was, what is the difference between art history and archeology? span Now art history, is a study of the visual, okay, a, a detailed study of the visual, okay, in a historical context. While archaeology is a method, and more because when the scientific method comes out, it becomes more of an independent discipline, um, and it focuses on dating and analysis, analysis and comparative uh, understanding and the method. While art history begin, it begins with the focus. It questions the focus. The question, so if there is no image, a sculpture, or a small piece of pottery, does it mean that there was no history? It doesn't mean that. It just definitely doesn't mean that. But as an art historian, I would like to see that. And I begin with that. Okay. And and uh, so, uh, so it both of them cover, they converge somewhere, material and immaterial things. But art history provides some sort of a flesh to a skeleton. The archaeology, it's not that I'm considering archaeology as a skeleton, because, and I'm not biased um, as such, but art history lends color, takes the artifact and puts it in a museum, in a nicer setting, okay? And it, it bring, gives color to a dry past, okay? So this is what we need, storytellers, Historians to become storytellers, uh, and that is what excites the younger generation. And uh, keep, you should keep in mind the younger generation and why they have lost interest in history and what is it that they are demanding from us, okay? Um, whether it is the rigor of the discipline or whether it is um, uh, uh, both rigor in one end as well as storytelling in another end, okay? And so with this, I will try to 
thank you all for being patient and listening and giving me the time and would be glad to take your questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Rao. And I also take this occasion to welcome Professor Andre Wink. I think he's joined us. Uh, maybe he's got up again, so we'll welcome him one more time once he takes his seat. So I think, uh, Lavanderji, we'll have a few questions. I just wanted to make a couple of observations. Uh, can you hear me? Can everyone yes. hear me? Yes. Perfect. I think uh, your uh, initial remarks were, I think, extremely important and moving. I know a number of people who have struggled in the California textbook cases. And, uh, uh, you know, it's like uh, when the stakeholders of these histories stood up to say, look, you know, we don't recognize ourselves in them. And the tremendous effects they have on generations of uh, Indians abroad uh, actually signals to uh, you know, the crisis we are in, you know, and uh, James Mill's colonialist portrayals of India continue to this day, both abroad and in India. The only difference is that Indians abroad have now broken through the glass ceiling, especially in the US, and they're leading a fight back. But I think we face similar difficulties in India too, isn't it, Lavanyaji? That's one of the reasons that this new document has come out. But I also think that your presentation foregrounds exactly some of the issues that, uh, you know, we had spoken of, which is the problems of history as a discipline, the problems of history as a struggle, and also problems of history as heritage. And in each of these domains, you have a multiplicity of contending ideas of what history is and should do. I mean, for example, one of the things that I got from your presentation, which was very useful, is that history is in, I mean, whatever we call history, has to be a comprehensive and integrated, uh, I think, inquiry. Because without art history, what I'm trying to say is, without art history, we can't understand, let's say, Vijayanagar. You know, it's not just by reading about certain aspects of Vijayanagar, but the way you illustrate it, uh, you know, uh, materials, uh, markets, the circulation of power uh, and uh, uh, art and what the art comes to mean. So in other words, uh, I'll take, oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Looking forward to looking at it, reading it. So I'm just saying that uh, actually your work seems to point towards better understanding when we regard the Indian past in civilizational terms, because all these things are integrated and uh, we can't compartmentalize, you know, too much. And one more little observation, then we can throw it open. Maybe Lavanyaji can say uh, the first few words and she will give the vote of thanks at the end. But I think, I think that the Bahubali statue, you were talking about it, I mean, Bahu Bali simply means the one whose Bahus are very strong. But the traditional name was Gomateshwara. Uh, now, in my view, and you know, I have read a little bit and I've talked to some people. You see, it is the representation, the giant representation of the Akhanda Purusha. You know, the massive primordial Purusha, which connects all the three worlds. So the Vedic Purusha has counterparts in the Ko Sanatani, in grand images of the Buddha, including the Bamiyan Buddha, the Gomanteshwara, uh, and there are grand images of the Tirthankars also. This, so, and ultimately you will see Vishnu portrayed like that, the Mother Goddess portrayed like that, Avalokiteshwara. So these are replications of that idea of the of the transcendental Purusha, I say, I say transcendental, but he or it is also grounded and it connects all the three worlds, you know, Bhur Bhuvaswa, all the three Lokas, the three times. So that is the image, uh, the, as I said, the primal image, which is an image of coherence, unity, stability, poise, which is how a civilization wants to see itself. Which is also replicated in the temples in the in the Meru Shikhara 
kind of architecture layer so i think that these are the kinds of parallels that we need to open up and and finally there were some questions maybe you can stop sharing your screen uh, professor rao if you don't mind so that uh, uh, you know we can have a yeah thank you so much we can see you better thank you you know someone uh, sent me a chat question saying that you know the chinese had a tradition of history the arabs had it the greeks had it but we didn't and i was simply trying to say that all of this depends on what you mean by history so if you think about itihasa uh, cultural memory puranas i don't think i can't think of anybody any other civilization which has had the kind of puranic wealth that india has every jati every little place has its puranas which are records and again you will need a hermeneutics to shift or sift the 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 myths or the legends from what we today consider history so anyhow i think professor andre wink also was here i wanted to welcome him formally but till that happens till he comes back to his seat let us throw it open and uh, if anybody has questions you can send it in the chat box you can raise your hand physically but i can't see all of you so uh, maybe you can also uh, uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask the question directly if you wish uh, and uh, but please be brief so that we can hear many voices i think professor andre wink has uh, oh again he's standing up and doing a, okay anyhow i don't know if he can hear me and uh, so let me just welcome him for a minute uh, if he settles down but in the meanwhile if anybody has a question then please uh, uh go ahead and uh, and uh, uh maybe lavanya ji you can start the ball rolling Oh, we can't hear you. You have to unmute. Please unmute. Yeah. So I, I I really liked how you explained Hampi and how it evolved into uh, institution to support many aspects of life. Um, the, is is there a way to know how many aspects of life Hampi supported uh, at its height? What do you mean? I don't understand aspects of life. Um, it, it's a trade town, religious town, you know, and um, arts town, and so uh, so. Uh, is there any distinct um, distinct distinct institution for each one of them right you know there is an art institute there is a craft institute there is a trade institute it's, is it like that uh, the guild system is not an ins an institution i have defined you know it's not just an organization it's not a random organization an institution has principles it has norms it has practices yeah. um, so when we say the matha becomes an institution um the the guild system becomes uh, uh, an organization and an institution that continues for such a long period whether it is from the chalukyan period or whether ayawale continued or other guilds of stone workers and this so we have inscriptions we have a lot of inscriptions from vijayanagar which is published by gopal and many others um and so looking at the details of the inscriptions how much is given to the, those at that inscriptions and the shalmule banjikas what was their funerary situation i mean i go further to anegondi and see what was their role and how uh, they were so powerful so powerful a guild uh, 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 that brings into fact how economics was also a very very major factor for this uh, kingdom you know uh, it's, it's not that it was not there before Oh, but I just concentrate on Vijayanagar. We also have in the Hoysala period, um, where we have lots of names of artists. That period is known for something else that I would research on. Uh, while uh, much of the guild system uh, 
inscriptions uh, are not there for the Harsara period. I think Professor Chudamani Nandagopal, Dr. Chudamani Nandagopal has a point. Go ahead. Hello, Nandini. Um, it was a wonderful, uh, you know, brilliant presentation. Uh, I would like to add here for the question uh, that what was its distinction, uh, Vijayanagar. Uh, I I think that you know Vijayanagar has to be seen as a civilization. We were talking about, you know, so far the many civilizational shifts, cultural shifts. We have to look at Vijayanagar from that perspective. You can't distinctly say that this is for that, that is why it is the civilization by itself. And it has created such a great milestone in the development of India of the medieval times. So that is the shift you see with the Vijayanagar. And it has to be studied with the multi methods. And one of them is the cultural, cultural memory, cultural methods. That is very important for Vijayanagar as a civilizational shift. This is, I just wanted to add with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you. I know Chidamani is an expert in art history and has helped me a lot. He's also the secretary of our SRL Memorial Foundation for Indian Archaeology, Art and Culture. And uh, and uh, thank you, especially I like this word, a shift to yes. uh, in, that period, a pre-modern period in India. Yes. Uh, and not a medieval period. Thank you again. You, you, know, you know, speaking of uh, pe periodizing history, I mean, we're still going with James Mill, you know. So let's also understand that there were these, uh, uh, you know, paradigms that they set, you know, medieval, modern, ancient, or Islamic, modern, and then ancient. And somehow, so, you know, there are deeper issues, but I like to point about multi-method. I think this is what I was trying to say, that history, uh, can you hear me at all or no? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I think for a civilizational, am I, am I breaking up? No, we can hear you. It's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm saying that Please go ahead. I was, I was just endorsing what, uh, what uh, Dr. Chudamani ji said, which is for a deeper civilizational understanding. We need a multi method. This is what I was trying to say at the beginning. We need what is considered yeah. history, you also need cultural memory. Now, along with history, you need archaeology, art history, uh, you know, cultural history, social history, sociology. You also need literature. You also need to understand poetry. I mean, look at Vijayanagar, you were saying, you know, Shayana, uh, Vidyaranyana, some people say it's a legend, but, you know, these commentaries and texts exist. So, the the I think the network of meaning is what we need to excavate uh, in order to get a deeper appreciation and understanding of our civilization. I while uh, uh, you know uh, people are thinking of questions, I was just reminded of uh, of two little things. You know, in this uh, I already mentioned it. But, uh, you know, I mentioned Jadunath Sarkar and, uh, you know, he was asked to write, rather be the chairman of an editorial board of the Bharatiya Itihas Parishad for the preparation of a new history of the Indian people in 20 volumes, you know. And the only thing that came of it, I don't know, it, you know, I think that the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan themselves did something which Professor Raghottam is going to talk about. But, you know, he, he sets out an agenda. He wrote to President Rajendra Prasad, and he said this, and I think it, it's good at the beginning of our deliberations. He said, national history, like every other history, worthy of the name and deserving to endure, must be true as regards the facts and reasonable in the interpretation of them. It will be national, not in the sense that it will try to suppress or whitewash everything in our country's past, which is disgraceful but because it will admit them and at the same point, uh, at the same time point out that there were other nobler aspects in the stage of our nation's evolution, which offset the former. 
So, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is if, if you want to write a new history of India, uh, we have the solid work of our forefathers to stand on. And uh, at the same time, as I said, just to quote one thing from, from Raja Rao, he said the, that facts are shrill, he said. Facts are not enough to understand India. And uh, he said that if you just look at facts, you will never understand India. I mean, this is his claim. I'm not saying anything. But uh, I'll just read you one, one excerpt from here where he says, uh, he says, uh, and, I, and in the end, I called it seeing with three eyes. So you see with the eye of fact, that's seeing with one eye. Then you see, the, see with the eye of legend, myth, folklore, uh, Sthala Purana, uh, or uh, Itihas. That's seeing with the second eye. But you have to see with the third eye, the eye of wisdom, which can synthesize these two eyes to get a deeper picture like the rishis of the Rig Veda when they said Agni Mere Purohitam because the fire that they were trying to kindle, what was that fire about? I mean, and in that very first stanza, he says the Hotra is somebody who brings the gods, you see. So our itihasas, the, they, they were meant to rouse us, they were meant to educate us, and ultimately elevators. They were meant to change our consciousness. You know, so what is Bharat if it cannot alter your consciousness? What is this Gomateshwara Bahubali if it cannot instill some notion of renunciation, some higher ideal? And I think you talked about children and how we teach history. I think somehow history can give us a clue to this. And on that note, let me welcome uh, Professor Andre Wink, uh, the most distinguished historian of our so-called medieval period in the world. His uh, books are of legendary depth and breadth. I started by reading your, your book on uh, Akbar, sir. It is so beautifully written. It is such a gripping narrative. Uh, that uh, then I started looking at the other books, and I think there's thousands of pages. You know, the the uh, your reconstruction of the uh, I think the making of the Indo-Islamic world, uh, and then before that, land and sovereignty in India, three volumes. Uh, so we welcome you. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we are very honored by your presence. Uh, we can't hear you, sir. Now, this is better. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm always a bit uh, challenged by these fancy technologies. Um, that's because I back to the 1980s. But uh, uh, good thing I'll be in a uh, heat wave here and a tire uh, early still. But, uh, I'm glad that we could connect. Um, a bit late, I apologize. No, not at all, not at all. I think it was, uh, uh, I mean, it was a bit early for most people, even in India at nine yeah, o'clock, yeah. uh, you know. So it was, uh, um, it must uh, be, uh, what time is it there now? Uh, Naliniji, it must be um, approaching uh, midnight for you, 11? Nine. It's 10 to 9, nine here. Yes, I think in the West Coast, in it must be. Okay. Oh, you're in Europe? Are you in Europe, Professor Wink? Are you in Europe just now? Athens. Yeah, I am um, in Greece nowadays. Um, oh. I, uh, I'm a permanent uh, European again. And uh, I left the United States two years ago. So now I'm a full-time writer. You can expect more um, scholarly production, such as it is. Oh, that's... Uh, yeah, I wish, uh, you know, in the introductory remarks, I mean, I talked about Herodotus and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the muse of this history. Is where, this is where, um, you know, for me, it's a lot of, a lot of inspiration in Greece. And uh, so it's very close to South Asia and Indonesia. And so, so this is where I live here. Um, in the United States, it, it takes about three days to get to, uh, to Asia. I think it's like five hours. 
So yes, I'm, you're I'm close to us. Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm very close to everything. Uh, I'm very glad to Yes, that's wonderful because, uh, you know, I was I was going to, you know, the Muse of History, uh, Cleo, and, uh, you know, we yeah. were talking about yeah. Shreyas, Akshitam, and, uh, you know, all of those things, Cleos, Aceton. I mean, I've brought those things yeah. up as older, yeah. older ideas of history and so forth. Like that. Yeah. that. Yeah. Now... Uh, now, uh, shall we? We are coming close to this, the end of this session. Yeah. I'm wondering yeah. if uh, Professor Chakravarti, are you there? Are you uh, willing to start? What shall we do? Do we want a little break now? Uh, maybe just a five minute break. Would we like that? I definitely want to thank uh, uh, Professor Nalini Rao for her inaugural address. It was very rich and it enhanced our understanding of the challenges in writing history especially Indian history, the history of Vijayanagar. I have another Vijayanagar expert, Professor Raghottam, who has reviewed your book, I believe. And uh, maybe that will be a good segue to the archaeology section uh, session uh, with Professor Chakravarti, because after all, Professor S.R. Rao was also a great archaeologist and the Dwarka excavations and so forth. So I think uh, we started off by problematizing the project uh, you know, of history, uh, history writing in India, historiography. We talked about the problems of discipline. I mean, history as discipline, history as struggle, history as heritage, recovering heritage, and so forth. And we looked at the ancillary and contributing disciplines, certainly art history, and now perhaps archaeology. So it's a good segue now. And uh, I invite, uh, I invite. Uh, 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 the keynote speaker, Professor Dilip Chakravarti. I invite uh, uh, Professor Venkat Raghotam to coordinate the session. But let me also request uh, Lavanya ji to just give a brief vote of thanks to Professor Nalini Rao and uh, just conclude our inaugural session, please. Thank you uh, so much. Um, uh... Professor Makran Pranjpe, your introduction uh, was excellent. You began with uh, Vedic sources and uh, Greek sources. Uh, it uh, started us on the right footing. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, Professor Nalini ji took us on a different direction, uh, textual sources to monumental sources, how we can use these monumental and artistic sources uh, to understand our history. That's what the uh, history writing should be. Uh, we should use, of course, textual sources, uh, but we should also use, we should also be willing to use monumental and artistic sources as well as uh, folk and uh, other sources. So, so we are, we are coming to that. Uh, and uh, I thank both of you, Professor Paranjpe, as well as Professor Nalini Rao uh, for your contribution and for your uh, lectures highlighting uh, what we need to do as we proceed with examining, uh, re-examining Indian history and trying to constitute a fact-based uh, history uh, for the future of India. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Professor Rao. Thank you, Chudamani ji. Thank you, everyone. And uh, may I now request Professor Aghutam to uh, conduct the keynote session. Uh, and the speaker is, of course, Professor Dilip Chakravarti. Go ahead, please. Can, you need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, please. We can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bhagavatamji. First of all, let me begin by thanking Professor Makran Paranjipe and Professor Lavanya for giving me this opportunity to participate in such a wonderful and intellectually rich uh, webinar with such eminent scholars. And I'm particularly happy to, uh, to see Professor Andre Wink, whose work I have long been familiar with and always look forward uh, at, uh, to see him because I first encountered his work when I was a student at the University of Hawaii, Manoa campus, uh, where I did my PhD 
with Professor Burton Stein. So I have been aware of his work, particularly his work on uh, sovereignty, his work on the Marathas and Al-Hind, uh, his work on the, the Indo-Islamic uh, world. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, contribution to medieval studies, and I'm really delighted uh, that he is here along with uh, the rest of us. And Professor Dilip Chakravarti, is a person with whom with whom my association goes back more than 40 years because I had my early education in Delhi University and uh, our uh, paths overlap in Delhi University. I, I was a student doing my MA before I went to the University of Hawaii for my PhD. I was a student at Delhi University in the 1970s and Professor Dilip Chakravarti was there. And that's and he was a very inspiring teacher at that time. Of course, he and I were both young. He was one of the, uh, the youngest, I think, in the faculty uh, in Delhi University those days. A very dynamic and a very sincere teacher. I, and I must say that he is one of the one of those who inspired me to go in for to be a historian. The other person uh, I must mention was Professor Geeta Banerjee who was my teacher in Hindu College, Delhi University, Hindu College, and Professor Dilip Chakravarti, and of course, Professor Burton Stein, all of whom uh, inspired me to take up this very, very uh, noble profession of reconstructing the past to which I have, uh, to the profession to which I have uh, dedicated most of my working life. Uh, what, uh, what I can say about Dilip Chakravarti, he has completely changed the contours of Indian archaeology by if, uh, you know, Indian archaeology essentially began with Sir Alexander Cunningham taking upon himself uh, uh, the task of giving uh, some kind of a skeleton uh, of archaeological uh, sites, depending on the uh, travel accounts of the Chinese pilgrims who visited India in the early medieval period. And that formed the basis of historical archaeology. But Professor uh, Dilip Chakravarti went far beyond that. He was the one who actually uh, started looking at the material culture of sites, uh, looking, investigating the relationship between the distribution of sites and the trade routes that connected the Deccan, the Ganjatik, and beyond, uh, providing a very important dimension to the study of early India. Uh, it was Professor Dilip Chakravarti who has written uh, enormous uh, uh, amounts of work on explicating the trade routes uh, that radiated right across India. And, and he has also been, and I think very correctly, uh, a critique of the kind of archaeology that was practiced in India, an archaeology that was essentially, I, sorry, uh, since we are all professionals here, I think I can use the term, a highly politicized archaeology that came into India uh, with uh, the Nehruvian dispensation, one that used archaeology as a prop, like it used history, as a prop for, uh, for building up and promoting uh, a political ideology. Uh, Professor uh, Dilip Chakravarti was extremely critical of this particular uh, dimension of Indian archaeology, and uh, and of course that uh, and and uh, and he has written um, uh, a number of books uh, on the concept of Indology and how the concept of Indology has been um, uh, has been to some extent subverted in the service of um, uh, of this idea. That India and its civilization is extraterritorial, extraterritorial to history, uh, and I think uh, Professor uh, uh, Chakravarti's work has been uh, very engaging uh, in all these dimensions. It has imparted an, uh, 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 an, uh, uh, an intellectual point uh, to the study of India's past, and then his association with Professor Alchin. Uh, who uh, at the University of Cambridge has obviously given um, um, uh, um, a much needed intellectual and uh, international background to Professor uh, uh, Dilip Chakravarti's work. And, uh, and of late, he has also been looking at 
the institutional history of the archaeological survey itself. You know, the archaeological survey um, has gone through several, several different avatars. And what we have today uh, uh, in the form of an archaeological survey, I do not know if, uh, if, if really serves um, any purpose uh, in making uh, and conserving the past of India, or it is instrumental in distorting India, because if you look at the budget and he himself in his paper will talk about it, the, uh, the, the various kinds of audits that have been made of the archaeological survey, much of it is dispensed in the, um, for certain groups of monuments in northern India, and by the time we take up the conservation repairs and other works of uh, South Indian monuments, particularly the Chola monuments, the Vijayanagara monuments, etc. Much, uh, much needs to be desired. And of course, there's another dimension of archaeology that uh, that we uh, we have uh, that I think uh, is coming to the fore, particularly now, is the repatriation of uh, Indian art treasures from different parts of the world. And uh, the archaeological survey, of course, has been doing a great job in the last six or seven years. But then these are dimensions of archaeology that Professor Dilip Chakravarti has touched upon in his um, uh, different works. And I think it's a great honor for me uh, to introduce him and uh, to, uh, to welcome him to this um, uh, webinar. And I look forward uh, to, uh, to hearing him. I once again thank uh, Professor Makran Paranjipai, who has been an a friend of mine and Professor Lavanya, who has kindly agreed uh, to be the international coordinator of this webinar uh, for, uh, for allowing me to be part of this. Thank you. And I now invite Professor Dilip Chakravarti uh, to present uh, his paper. So you have to unmute yourself, sir. We can't hear you. Professor Chakravarti. Yes, that's better. Thank you. You are being asked to unmute yourself. Do I unmute, unmute myself again or? No, no, we can hear you, hear you. Professor Chakravarti, we you're, can hear you. You're fine, you're fine. Oh, thank you. Early this year, I published a book called What the Aspects Nationalism in the Study of Ancient Indian History. Now, my paper today is a kind of continuation of that. I'm doing a separate book called Aspects of Nationalism in Indian Archaeology. So can, can, I, can I request you please to center, uh, center your image I mean, you can move your computer. You're right at the corner of the image now. If you can center it a little bit, that would be nice. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. I'm Perfect. completely unfamiliar with this Perfect. technology. Thank you. <laughs> a report entitled Preservation and Conservation of Monuments and Antiquities was tabled by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India in Indian Parliament in the second half of 2013. It was basically a performance audit of the Archaeological Survey of India by the CAG, the first audit of this kind ever conducted of this premier national archaeological organization. The result would not have been any different, even if the various other ancillary archaeological organizations of the country, the state archaeology departments, museums, and the strictly limited number of Indian universities with archaeology wings had been subject to this type of audit. One would also state that the Indian archaeological community has so far displayed no sign of interest in the CAG report. What emerged from this report as an inescapable conclusion was that there is no way to argue that as a nation we have taken good care of our archaeological past. It may further be noted that the CAG report was restricted only to the examination of technical issues within the defined and accepted frame of duties 
of the archaeological survey of India. It did not go beyond its brief and consider the implications of the emerging field of archaeological knowledge in the context of the nation's past to the world. The purpose of the present paper is precisely this, how the leading archaeologists of the country have been mostly unaware of the nationalist dimensions of the newly explored and excavated archaeological data, and how most of them have tried to assess the country's developmental stages only in terms of contracts with civilizations outside. The validity of the foregoing point was understood not by any professional Indian historian or archaeologist, but by Ram Manohar Lohia, one of our great parliamentarians and socialist thinkers. The occasion of the publication of the first volume of the UNESCO History of Mankind series, and the matter is contained in Lokshava debates, third series, etc. The original speech of Dr. Lohia is in Hindi, and for the English version, it returned to collected works, aided by Masram Kapoor, volume six. I thank Dr. Onirban Rangupadha at Sama Prasad Mukherjee Foundation for kindly drawing my attention to this. The subject matter of this parliamentary discussion was the UNESCO volume titled Prehistory and the Beginnings of Civilization, which included, among others, the section in Indian Civilization. Dr. Lohia writes, The errors that I'm going to point to quote, the errors that I'm going to point out in this book may not at the outset seem very important, but misunderstanding of Indian history by writers within and outside the country is so great that I'll try to explain its significance by a number of examples. Firstly, it is supposed that whatever occurs in India must be imitation of some other country or civilization. It is either for China or Mitra or Ur or Chaldea or some other place. It has been said in this book by Leonard Uli that when one looked at the North Gateway of the Great Stupa at Sachi, one could not help feeling that it was inspired by the wooden architecture of China. And the strange part of it is that the statement was challenged not by an Indian member of the commission, nor by Dr. Hatrishnan, but by Russian historian for Israelis. And then Mr. Uli writes in a small note, quote, it's an impression and there is no proof, but the impression is worth recording, unquote. This is how history is being written. Mr. Rudy writes that the Stupa at Shachi had inspiration from China. This challenged by Soviet historian, that the learned professor Rudy writes, because that impression was in his mind, that was to be recorded, although there was no proof for it. Historians, both Indian and foreign, are such rotten-headed rotten people. It is ingrained into the minds of our children that India had nothing of its own. Everything was either imitated or influenced by outside factors. These historians can go to absurd lengths. In the book, there is mention about another book called 5,000 Years of Pakistan. On this particular book, Dr. Lohia's comment is that it was the intention of the Western writers to give Pakistan the impression of being very ancient and familiar, and also to strengthen the roots of India's partition. With regard to the Indus or Harpan civilization, Dr. Lohia points out that at the back of the opinion, except with the volume, that the fortification walls of Harappa were intended to overcome the countryside was the assumption that the ruler and the citizens, wherever the alien stop, which had reduced the indigenous inhabitants to the states of South. Dr. Lohia goes on to comment. Quote, these historians rule out the possibility of new trends emerging from the core of Indian society. And they rule the mind of the Indian historians, the biggest of them, in such an overwhelming manner that even the historians of India suppose that any renewal of the Indian culture is impossible without contact with the foreigner. The letter could be either the Afghan or the Mughal or the English and so on. At this point, Dr. Lohia expresses very clearly his dissatisfaction with the prevalent idea that India has always assimilated her aggressors. Quote, we must try a halt to this kind of thinking. Assimilation is always of two kinds. It is either the slave or the master. The history of India of the last 1,000 years can teach only the assimilation of the first time. It is no use blaming only the foreign historians. The Indian historians are wallowing in the same poison. Dr. Lohia's comments in this parliamentary debate include some more valuable points. But from our point of view, I shall cite only one more of them. Quote, the problem of the Nagas, the Mijos, Kashmir, Adivasis, and the like, had behind them this poisonous error of interpreting our history in the wrong way, of dividing the people into Aryans, non-Aryans, Dravidians, and Mongols. 
and this whole edifice has been erected on the slender evidence of linguistic variations. Dr. Lohia's characterization of Indian historiography as disease and his emphasis on the inability of Indian academic historians to come out of the lot of foreign influences and invasions may seem harsh, but is nonetheless true. This in fact is, is glaringly true in the case of archaeology. As late as 73-74, H. V. Shankarya, the doyen of India's university archaeologists, did not hesitate to put in print that India was always a colony. This attitude persists in various forms till today, especially in the institute which Shankarya headed and also in the university department set up by Shankarya student B. Subbarao at Vadodara. Around 1976, I put forward the claim of India being an already an independent center of iron metallurgy, but there was a great reluctance on the part of Indian scholars to accept it. And it was only after Rakesh Tiwari's discovery of already iron bearing level in the central Ganga plain that the idea was eventually accepted. In 1968, I pointed out the mutual contradictions and various inequities in the attempts to identify Aryans in the Indian archaeological record but nobody is interested to discard the RN hypothesis at that point. Now, even after the nuances of vicious racism, implicit in Aryan theory, and the unacceptability of the various assumptions behind this theory have been pointed out by an increasing number of people, including me, there are not many scholars who are ready to see the Aryans as a mythical entity, entity modeled on the triumph of the Europeans in the modern period. Scholars have also shut their mind to the improbability and illogicality of the linguistic hypothesis to establish historical truth, although some of them have begun to come around to this view. Equally importantly, Indian archaeologists have been completely indifferent to the nationalistic dimensions of the Indian archaeological scenario. One may cite a few specific examples in this regard. The Californian textbook controversy several years ago was fought with some bitterness. And the primary author of the concerned controversial book was J.M. Kenoe, who refused to retract anything he wrote regarding Hinduism in that book. Kenoe is an archaeologist, and what I find amazing is his acceptability, despite his clearly anti Hindu stance in the foregoing controversy, to a wide range of Indian archaeologists and archaeological organizations. Among other things, the list of Indian authors who belong to Indian universities and the Archaeological Survey of India in the felicitation volume meant for him is impressive. One further learns that the excavatory materials from Tola Bira were partly handed over to some students of Kenway, as the names of authors in the ASI volume on Tola Bira show. Secondly, now that the government of India pursues an open door policy regarding foreign participation in archaeology, all that the foreign archaeologists have to do is to contact a suitably plural Indian university archaeologist and get him or her to work on the project. The Indian university people are only too eager to jump into this bandwagon because this brings them some supposedly quote unquote international reputation and the co-authorship of some publications without even being aware of the implications of what the concerned projects have been doing. Their role in this project is essentially that of the native Banyans in the days of the East India Company. They would explore the native situation and turn it to the advantage of their foreign collaborators in return for considerable personal gains for themselves. Thirdly, although the concept of the sociopolitics of the past has been current in global archaeological literature since 1986, and although I have published several books related to this concept, this has fallen on deep fears in Indian archaeology. By sociopolitics of the past, many Indian and foreign archaeologists mean only what they call Hindutva archaeology, and some of them have even gone to the extent of criticizing the legal aspect of the Supreme Court judgment on Ayodhya. The link between the Indian left liberal group and the foreign anti-India anti group is crystal clear. If only we bother to investigate the recent literature. Nationalism covers innumerable details of a national life, culture, and landscape. It cannot be a uniform set of ideas, and individual archaeologists have to find their own fit in this multi hued national world. What I have perceived on the basis of my own investigations 
is that the ancient landscape of India has not significantly changed since the prehistoric and the historic periods. From keeping the basic pattern of its site distribution, root network, and metallurgical and craft practices intact or basically unchanged. My idea is that there are various elements of continuity since the formation of the Indus civilization landscape as well. This brings me to an important point of my present discussion. We are currently at the door of a new and fundamentally significant realization about India's trajectory of historical development. Purely on the basis of archaeology, this shows an uninterrupted column from circa 7000 to the dawn of historical era between circa 800 and circa 500 BC. This archaeological picture covers a vast part of northwestern and northern India and possibly a large section to the Deccan and the south, although in the case of the latter, the evidence is not always explicit. But I suppose it is the case of generating more discoveries and obtaining more data. What is equally noteworthy is that this protohistoric column of the above mentioned time frame imperceptibly recedes into the earlier prehistoric sequence, which takes the story of human prehistory in the subcontinent to about 1.5 to 2 million years ago. The richness and diversity of prehistoric lithic finds, including Docker in India, have turned out to be mind boggling, although a lot more regarding them is yet to be discussed. However, our main focus in the present context is our prehistoric, protohistoric honor. The point is that the entire corpus of the Vedic literature, regardless of the controversies regarding its date, has to fall somewhere in this period between the eighth millennium and the first part of the first millennium. Nothing is in broad daylight yet. In the script is under it and apparently very limited in quantity. Where we cannot yet go on interpreting various in the stuff in the light of Vedic references. This would make the confusion worse confounded. Even when the script is satisfactorily read, it is unlikely that it will be exposed to the deluge of Harappan documents. The reason is that most of the signs of the Harappan script show that they were used only on comparatively limited occasions, meaning thereby that the volume of Harappan documents that we have is seriously incomplete. This can be explained only with the assumption that the more usual medium of Harappan documentation was perishable material like the parts and family. In view of their continued use till the early part of the 20th century, there is no reason to doubt in this familiarity with them as early as in the civilization. Further, one must draw attention to the fact the gap between the end of the Indus civilization around 1200 BC and the beginning of what is called the early historic period in about 800 to 500 BC throughout India has considerably narrowed. And one has the right to doubt if the tradition of liter liter literacy represented by the Indus script ever ended and did not transform itself into the Brahmic script of the historical period. The lower end of the Harappan chronology is based first on a series of dates on the site of Harappa, and secondly on the find of Harappa inscribed seals in the Kassite context of the Mesopotamian site of Nippur and one or two sites in the Dal. The basic truth of the situation is, however, unmistakable and underscores the basic point of civil India's civilizational continuity, both in terms of archaeology and literature. We also have to accept that the Indus civilization is the keystone of the whole development. From my nationalist point of view, the significance of the Indus civilization as the keystone of India's great tradition cannot be explained. Some archaeologists, both foreign and Indian, have begun to do precisely this, something which should be combated all the way. The idea that the Indus civilization was the keystone of India's great tradition is based on two facts. First, the Indus material is found from North Afghanistan to the upper part of the Godavari Valley, and from the Pakistan-Iran border to the fringe of Haridwar. Along with this huge geographical presence, one has also to consider that what is called OCP and what constitutes a part of the Harappan tradition around 2000 or 2200 BC covers the whole of the Doab up to near Allahabad. 
Can one imagine the impact of a tradition with such a widespread distribution and consequent areas of interaction in the rest of India will have in the rest of India? Secondly, as one looks at the archaeological manifestations are upon religion, one clearly defines the echo of modern Hinduism down to the presence of Shiva in the form of stone and even terracotta lingers on the Harappan side. Thirdly, the continuity of different craft practices, including different forms of metallurgy from the Harappan times to pre modern India, has always been scarce. And one can even argue, as I have, that there has not been a substantial change in the Harappan landscape since the Harappan settlement flourished in the confront region. In 2007 to 8, I moved around extensively in Haryana Punjab, and although not a scientist, I could feel on the basis of visual observations of sites in the country that the Indus sites and thus the civilization could flourish in the context of a landscape which could not be much dissimilar to what can be observed in the region today. For instance, some many village sites of the region lie on sand dunes. A little sand scraping tells us that the sand dunes form the typical context of the topography when the ancient settlements are flourishing. I went to the extent of asserting that we should be ready to appreciate the growth and flourishing of the Indus civilization in a climatic context which prevails in this region today. More accurately, this should be something which is indicated by the Haryana disasters reflecting climatic and water related situation in the 19th century. The only allowance I'm ready to give is a better availability to water and related wetness throughout the area. A close study of the 19th century and somewhat later disputes of Haryana Punjab showed that there were rich, well watered patches of land in the entire region, right up to the extinct coast of the Bhagavad in Rajasthan. The availability of water during the monsoon was never in doubt. The gazetteers even speak of trains running through certain sections during at least the monsoon. This may well reflect the historical situation. There is nothing in the historical record which testifies that the Ghabbar Hakra flow ever completely dried up. There is a reference to the eastern section of the Saraswati in one of the geographic sources, and some literary sources refers, refers to an agricultural effort for Asaryana, which crossed by irrigation canal. The source of this water is the monsoon water, which was water nonetheless, and this water could adequately nourish the settlement from the Ghabbar Hakra flow. I am aware that a whole barrage of science-based fire may be directed against hypothesis of this kind. But if one is tolerant enough to consider the pre-modern landscape of modern Haryana and Punjab, one is likely to admit that the region formed a well-watered canal based system. I also believe that the idea of India, the idea of what Dr. S. Kalana Raman has pointed out, is as early as the said, the idea of Haratam Janam goes back to the period of Indian civilization. The most direct evidence is in the form of Ganjati copper road implements of circa 2000 BC, found as far south as Ramanathapuram in Tamil Nadu in the Munnar area of Kerala. But there is no reason why it cannot date from the middle of the third millennium BC, roughly the starting point of the material form of the Indian civilization. The modern attack on the homogeneity and the centrality of the Indian civilization in Indian tradition has emerged from a number of quarters, among which the Indian quarter is fairly significant. Some years ago, an American archaeologist coined a term, sort of Harappa, to indicate some local features in the presence of the Harappan civilization in the region. Although the term sort of Harappa meant much more than an agglomeration of local features, the point is that a good number of Indian archaeologists from Baroda, Pune, and other places took coup from this and became very keen to find clusters of local developments all over Gujarat, using in the process such local geographical terms as Anat Harappan, Lat Harappan, etc. Their focal point is to highlight the local pottery features of the Harappan development, ignoring the civilizational phenomenon which emerged at the end of all these regional developments. To them, the Harappan civilization was only a quote unquote veneer on the top of this regional development. The choice of the term veneer is unfortunate because the term is reminiscent of the veneer which the carpenters put on the top of the dining tables, etc., and surely doesn't suggest the growth of the civilization was organically related to what happened in the same regions earlier. This is somewhat like the attempt of many Indologists to deny the existence of Hinduism as religious homogeneity on the ground 
there is a various state like South Sudan, Western Sudan, etc. in the background. The brusqueness, apart from ideological assertion, has always amazed me. And the same can be said about the incredible eagerness of some Indian archaeologists to deny the presence of the variety glory of the Harappan and Indian civilization in the name of its differing regional background. Some Indian archaeologists have also began to wonder why the study of the Harappan civilization should occupy so much space in the Indian archaeological literature in comparison with the space allotted to various regional cultural studies. The politics of the Harappan studies is a major topic in Spain. The fact that it is entirely missing is entirely due to the ind complete indifference of Indian archaeologists themselves to evaluate the nationalistic implications of the investigations which have been interpreted in the offered for the concerned archaeological research. In conclusion, we should get back to what Ram Dr. Lamban or Lohia expressed as an anguish in Indian Parliament in 1963. How is it that our lens ancient history should invariably be considered as the tail end of development elsewhere? Very few archaeologists of the country had been interested in the question, but some of us had been keenly aware of the deep anguish which led to this question. There have also been discoveries galore, and it is possible, again, only for some of us to put all, all these discoveries in the frame of an essentially Indian narrative, a narrative in terms of an immeasurably old and continued human occupation without any break in our civilization and column. In two of my publications, Indian Archaeological History and the Oxford Companion to Indian Archaeology, I put forward this narrative. Although the narrative would now require some updating in the light of the data accrued in more recent years. Meanwhile, in the border lands and boundaries of the Indian subcontinent, from Balochistan to the Pathway Range and Arakanuma, 2018, I tried to offer a geographical frame within which India's interactions with the bordering regions may be historically and geographically appraised. In my Nationalism in the Study of Ancient Indian History, 2021, I argued the communist control of the ancient historic Indian historical studies virtually destroyed the essential source-based study of ancient India over a period of about 60 years since the 1960s. In various forms, this control is still in place and requires to be carefully dismantled. Although the people currently in power have not yet gone beyond uttering platitudes in this regard. They've also been joined by a large number of professional and non-professional people who do not seem to know what they wish to find historically in ancient India. Meanwhile, the country's archaeologists have failed, by and large, to be concerned with the implications of their analysis of archaeological discoveries for the nation. Thank you very much. It's a brief summary of the modern Indian archaeological situation, which is which can be fairly off, depending on the way we look at it. Whatever we may find in India, that will be its analogy has to be found somewhere outside the country. This is bad scholarship. In fact, it is idiotic scholarship. And also, this is very demeaning. In fact, my anger about about these matters is where no one says we're not going to them. But but I, I uh, but having, gone, having gone through Indian geography uh, the past two hundred years or so, ancient Indian geography, I have not put so much blame on the colonial historians, except of the ilk of James Mill and others. Mill was influenced by ecclesiastical factors. I mean, he was not even a gentleman, and Lord knows why we made so much of it. But the other historians, professional ones, even Vincent Smith and that governor of Bombay, Mansoor Elphinstone. Elphinstone's book on the history of India, even this brief ancient history section, is a super one. Well written, cogently argued, and evokes the landscape of India, which our sort of historians don't do. Uh, Sorry for my language, but then kind of heavy. Uh, so let us not blame the colonial historians and to argue 
that we Indian we Indians had a sense of history. It is purely rubbish, Professor Branch. Do you know why? Because if you pick up the history, try to evaluate the source of the history of any region in the context of ancient India, you will find the sources don't simply exist. See, that's the tragedy. We don't have the sources in adequate number, adequate quantity. He'll say about the Gupta period, and even for that, I mean, it is only till you come to the beginning of a period, I mean, period like this, that you have some ability to produce sources, sources and get quantity. So let us not, let us no longer blame the colonial historians. They did that business in their own way, no doubt about it. But why should we be so concerned with them after so many years of independence? Let us write our own history. The Vivekanand International Foundation of Delhi has been trying to publish a new series on the history of ancient India since 1911. Eight volumes have been published. Uh, the series has been modeled essentially on the model of Harati Vidya Bhavan series. And even while doing that, I realized how indifferent we are to the writing of, writing of history in our own context. In fact, one of the reasons why this series has got delayed, only eight volumes have been published and three more volumes have been Has the, has the series been published, I believe, no? In 2013, I saw the the launch six volumes. Eight volumes have been Has published. it come out, sir? Out of the 11 volumes. Eight volumes. So eight. I think that's a monumental. Oh, okay. I'm aware. I'm aware of that project. I even visited and checked and all the different difficulties that you encountered as the general editor. Uh, and you're absolutely right that it's pointless blaming the colonial. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that we should have done. We haven't, uh, as it happens, uh, Professor B.B. Lal, who was uh, you know, the DG of the Survey of India, also was the director of IIAS for a while. I met him recently. So he was also telling me about uh, how some of these uh, archaeological survey things have failed. You know, In fact, our building here itself is under their control to some extent and they're not at all helpful uh, but uh, you know uh, going back to what you said i know i have i had a I attended a seminar by professor ashoka kludkar of british columbia and he said that before the invasion of alexander nothing in india can be dated that's what he said in his i mean we're not talking about paleolithic and you know those dates where you have other kinds of evidence but the the point that, in fact, I was trying to make was that uh, uh, and the others have talked about it. He did why I mean, the turn in the writing of history also. I don't know if you can hear me because I, my video is constantly. I mean, your video is constantly spinning. Can you hear me at all? Oh yes, of course. We we can hear you. Am you I audible? Video went spinning, but we can hear you. Okay, I think I'll just switch off my video. We seem to have some bandwidth issues, but I'm only saying that uh, what constitutes history has also undergone uh, so much change, and a lot of recent historians, including Tanika Sarkar and all, they just look at literary sources. They're not writing conventional histories. They're reconstructing a certain period in Bengal, let's say, by reading Rabindranath Tagore. So the old questions of sources of history, what constitutes history, I mean, they, they are perennial. These are perennial questions before us. And uh, uh, it seems to me that if our, if our ancient people did not write these kinds of histories that we consider histories, they must have had a reason. I mean, we can't date Kalidas, we can't date Bharat, we can't, uh, you know, Nati Shastra, we can't date almost any of our classical thinkers, Bhartrihari, uh, Patanjali, uh, you know, the Rishis are not dateable. So, and if you read, I mean, if you look at the way the Mahabharata is written, it is deliberately dehistoricized. 
in a variety of ways, you know, and it becomes archetypal. It becomes something that is not for a particular time or an audience. So, I mean, I'm just trying to say that these are questions before us, which I'm not sure have easy answers, you know, and that, uh, uh, but, but, I mean, look at the California textbook uh, controversy, look at the controversies in India over medieval uh, history, uh, you know. I, wouldn't you say that many things have been left out and there are corrective possibilities today? Uh, and you have written eloquently. I remember you wrote an article after D. N. Jha passed away. And, and I think you made the argument that beef eating had suddenly become the most important thing in Indian history, whether people ate beef or not. I'm not sure I'm quoting you accurately, but I'm saying we're in the middle of history wars of some sort, and uh, uh, it bears some reflection of what are the constructive ways of going forward. Indian lit has harmed the study of ancient India in an immeasurable way. But I have lived through it. Uh, Last 60 years have been the story of communist control of Indian history, as simple as that. And the first thing which should be done is to, is to neutralize that influence. And this should be done fairly vigorously. We are objectives in that. To be power in Delhi, current power in Delhi, starting with the faintest idea of how to go about. I can't, I can't think of any single step taken by the IP in chair in recent years to neutralize the communist control. Uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, you know, the nexus, can you hear me? You uh -huh. know, yes. official histories, official, yeah. I mean, the, I, many times the government intervention is like the kiss of death uh, because uh, things change and every one of these councils, ICHR, ICSSR, ICPR, they're, they're all plagued with the history of conflict. Uh, we're not able to agree uh, on a variety of issues. So, and I think that uh, you said many of our incidents uh, can, uh, uh, you know, can also attest to these internecine conflicts, uh, you know, ideological and periodic purges. Professor Raghottam may come in. I think in the South, they face, uh, yeah, you know, yet other kind of, uh, I would call it, uh, um, I don't know what to call it. There's a whole Dravidian movement they are often in power. That creates its own pulsion. So, so I think that this project of, you know, uh, sort of reconsidering historiography in the current time is fraught with all these pressures, I think. And I'm not very sure, you know, what is to be done. But uh, now the real question is, do we want some discussion because it's a keynote session? Normally, keynote sessions do not necessarily, you know, have a discussion, but it depends on Professor Chakravarti. We still have a few minutes because at 1.30 we have, uh, yes, at 1.30 we have to come back for Professor, I think it's Sharadindu uh, Mukherjee's presentation, 1.30 to 3. In fact, our times have somewhat been adjusted for people to be able to participate because already it's getting very late in the U.S. Uh, for, for people joining us from the U.S., uh, I think West Coast is midnight. After a while, Lavanya Ji will start dropping off, I think. Uh, it'll be a challenge to keep awake. Uh, so anyhow, you, you tell me, how would you like to go about it? Uh, Professor Chakravarti, do you want to entertain a few questions? Oh, what certainly. do you think, Professor Raghottam? Certainly. Okay. Okay. Okay, please, please, then, Professor Agotam, you can invite questions. Lavanya ji, if you have a comment, please. Uh, it's a great lecture. 
um, highlights many of the issues that the Indian history has faced. Um, thank you so much for your later, um, uh, Professor Chakravarti. It's um, uh, how to go about it is a is a question, uh, and it takes a lot of um, official will uh, and official. Um, also, involvement. Um, it, the the Indian history as it is now presented actually comes uh, from East India companies' um, expenditure. You know, you, you don't want us to blame the colonial history, but uh, East India Company had spent, you know, in in current. Uh, current budget, it would be millions of dollars. So they have say, spent millions of dollars to create a narrative. Uh, uh, so, so the same amount of will and uh, involvement uh, should be there to correct this narrative. Uh, of course, there is, there is, there is. Um, I agree with you. Uh, there is, there is some. Uh, lack of interest, lack of willingness on the part of the um, uh, historians in the last 50 years. They could have done it, but uh, it's dominated by sections that, that had no will to do it. Uh, but um, I, 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 uh, I, I really think the, the, our history comes from the colonialist uh, machinations. Uh, and the corrections also need to be uh, um, done uh, with the involvement of a lot of uh, lot of official uh, villain involvement. So, you know, the, just a footnote: the VI, the VIF uh, history, eight volumes, as you said, it's a it's a magnificent achievement, but it's not properly discussed. It's not even easily available. And it's rather expensive. I think each volume is, I can't remember, but it's some several thousand rupees. So there's an issue of dissemination also of some of these uh, big histories. I think the Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture also had a series of books on history, Bharati Bhavan, Vidya Bhavan did. So this is what we are doing. And uh, the ICHR, there's so many such organizations which are supposed to fund it, as, as Lavanya ji said. Uh, so there's no cohesion, obviously, and uh, uh, there are star historians, individual historians, big stars. I named one of them in the beginning. There are many others also. So this is the way. This is the way the field is right now. So if if we take Lavanya ji's question, what should be done? Then what do you suggest? I've taught in Indian universities for many years, 25 years with Ms. Wise. And what I find is that we simply don't work enough. I mean, if all the history departments, if all the members of the departments could engage themselves professionally in, deeply in the subject, things would have been improved much faster. But we have not done that. As far as ancient history is concerned, I am reasonably knowledgeable in the sense that I keep track of whatever is happening in various Indian university departments. And there the picture is disappointing. So basically, we have to pull ourselves up. I can think of universities with full faith ancient Indian history, culture, and archaeology departments, which don't even hold their classes properly. Not to speak of research, let alone research. So that is one of the serious problems. And that can be solved by individual efforts. If the government wishes to help, it is welcome, but still, individuals also have got their basic duties. Nobody asked Indian archaeologists to be essentially be imams. In fact, in my moments of bitterness, I considered the headline the Bayman soul. Nobody asked us to do that. Nobody asked us to video worship Mark Kenway, a prominent figure of the California textbook on this. So 
toward the grassroots level, we have to be more aware of ourselves, what we do and what we achieve and what we are going to achieve. And meanwhile, all of us have to define our own lines of work. In fact, Indian archaeology has never been nationalistic. We have made discovery, but that's about it. And we have made discoveries because a tremendous amount of money is spent every year on doing archaeological research, archaeological excavation. You see, the PhD report on the archaeological survey that ought to have been read by everybody interested in ancient Indian. But that report has been digested. Nobody is this problem, by it. It's a public document. Yeah. You see, you have raised, sir, you have raised a number of issues. And uh, we are not able to address those, obviously, because every university a department, not only of history, but of many other departments, we know how they function. And when it comes to archaeology, I was at Nalanda a couple of years ago. The sites, you know, they've excavated, they've like become garbage bins. You know, people throw, they go to visit and then they throw things there. And many, I think, very valuable things are probably lost in the process you know so there we work in spurts suddenly there's an interest certain things happen and then for years nothing will happen anyhow so these are structural uh, institutional political and so forth issues uh, and uh, i think professor agotam maybe you can offer your uh, concluding remarks since we haven't had any questions, because I think everyone, everything you've said is so spot on. I mean, it's our daily experience and you have identified all these things and you're absolutely right. There's a very, uh, you know, it's a, you can have a cheap prejudice against historians without doing anything uh, that equals their work. So all these things we suffer from, you know, reaction, reactive, what I may call, there are histories, then there are anti-histories, then there are revenge histories, then there are non-histories, you know, where, where there are uh, attempts to write histories, but they're hardly historical, you see. So it's all, it's a, it's a bit of this, you know, uh, and a bit of that. Uh, so we, we are, I think, uh, suffering from this, uh, all these issues, but at a theoretical level, I mean, the only thing I wanted to add to what you said was that uh, I think you, you're you're still in favor of a kind of logic, logical, positivistic framework, you know, uh, because possibly of the archaeological background. Whereas uh, history is now so so often considered as a narrative, you know, I think uh, it's a narrative like any other narrative and uh, therefore has uh, the same, uh, you know, I think I remember uh, the statement, I'll just read it if I can find it, uh, of Sudipto Kaviraj. Uh, I think he mentioned the unconscious, the unhappy consciousness, Bankim Chandra, Chattopadhyay, and the formation of the discourse uh, of India. He says, influential recent view is a series of narratives. Apparently, this is a relatively simple and unsurprising statement. In fact, however, it is one of the strongest and most far-reaching of attacks on the positivistic conception of uh, the historian's art. If history is a subset of all narratives, it displaces the criterion of history in a crucial way. Fiction is also narrative, Thus, history, instead of being distinguished by the trueness of the story, is now distinguished by the storiness of its truth. So I, I really love that phrase, 
the storiness of its truth rather than the trueness of the story. What distinguishes history then is a form, a way of colligating events, but the events so colligated can either be true or imaginary. This historicity of history does not consist in fact uh, that it states things which actually took place, but it out in a particular structure. So, you know, this is what I began with, you know, this is a kind of, uh, you might say, postmodernist, uh, uh, whatever, uh, destabilization of the discipline of history. I see that Lavanya ji is both yawning and very sleepy. It must be very late there. I think you should, I think, take a nap, Lavanya ji, we'll see you again. Uh, you, you'd rest now. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, we'll soon uh, conclude this session. If you want to wait for just five minutes, Professor Agotam can offer us concluding remarks, and then we can reassemble. In fact, in the afternoon, if everyone is agreeable, and if, uh, if, if Professor Kharji and uh, uh, Professor Venkat Raghottam can hear me, of course, and if Professor Danyar Patel can hear me, we can resume at two o'clock because there are no uh, you know, participants in our afternoon session from abroad. So we can have a more leisurely break now from about half past 12 to 2 and resume at 2. If that is okay with Professor Sharadindu Mukherjee, is that all right? And uh, with Professor Dilip uh, uh, Chakrabarti, is that okay for you to join us oh, yes. at 2 p.m. Indian Standard Time? You'll also get a bit of break possibly a siesta, because you've been up very, very early. Uh, so I now invite uh, Professor Agotam to offer his concluding remarks, sir. And we'll close this session uh, after his remarks around, uh, well, 12.25 or 12.30, as he chooses, and resume at 2 p.m. Is that okay, Professor Mukherjee? Can Professor Sharadindu Mukherjee hear me? If not, I request... Uh, uh, I request Ritika ji to call him and tell him that block, okay? With those uh, words, uh, may, may I invite Professor Agotam to conclude this session, please? Unmute yourself, sir. Please unmute yourself. Uh, don't think we can hear you. You should unmute yourself. Uh, Professor Agotam? Now? Can you now hear me? We can hear, we can hear now. Um, I, I would like yes. to extend yes. uh, the argument of Professor Dilip Chakravarti uh, to South India, uh, uh, where identity politics has led uh, to its fair share uh, of distortion of history. Uh, he has rightly pointed out about the, uh, the, the Harappan civilization and, uh, and the way in which Harappa um, has been farmed out to different kinds of uh, uh, distorting images of early India. In South India, there is a great deal of purchase of uh, the Harappan civilization in the sense it becomes the ancestor of the so-called Dravidian civilization. I called it so-called because if you have an Aryan, you have to counterpose it with the Dravidian. And that is how these narratives play out because with every, every toxic narrative of the Aryan invasion, you have another narrative that is invested deeply in the same narrative. So toxic narratives feed on each other. And in the case of Southern India, this idea of Dravidianism feeds not only a secessionist uh, tendency, which we all know, it also feeds into linguistic chauvinism. It feeds into caste chauvinism, though on the surface it may pretend that it is liberating. I would like to touch upon just one one feature because we are we have with us a very eminent archaeologist, Professor Dilip Chakravarti. Uh, you know the origin of Brahmi script was one of those 
con uh, those aspects of India's history, which was generally regarded as beyond controversy. Generally, Ashoka uh, was the progenitor in some way or other, and it is from the Mauryas that the script got diffused all over India. That has been more or less a standard um, right from the time James Prince kind of deciphered it. And I think it's substantially true. Uh, there may be a few variations uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, regional variations, but now uh, there is a whole new narrative that is being put into place that Ashoka borrowed the, uh, the Barami script from the Tamil script. And this is absolute, uh, what can I say, is not even distortion. It is, uh, it is a creation of a fiction to feed uh, this kind of what I would call the false uh, narratives of Dravidianism, Tamil exceptionalism, South Indian exceptionalism, fragmentation rather than the nation, etc. And I think it is high time that we uh, sort of combated these sort of narratives because the Brahmi script is uh, not only uh, is the origin of all the scripts of India, but right up to Thailand, probably even the Kanji script um, in uh, in um, Japan has some residual kind of a uh, echo of the Brahmi script. Almost all the scripts of Southeast Asia are to some extent derived from Brahmi. And, and so it becomes a major intellectual contribution of India, apart from the, you know, Buddhism and various mathematical concepts, and of course, medical concept, medicinal concept, philosophy, etc. Script, which is the distinguishing mark between uh, history and prehistory, uh, was in many ways a contribution of India, and even that is being uh, re revisited or uh, should I say undermined. And I think what Professor Dilip Chakravarti has said is extremely important, and I wish uh, uh, we will address such issues uh, in the days to come, because I think these are vital issues, and if we have to take the writing of history seriously, and history is a critical discipline, it is not as a post-colonialist um, uh, would like us to believe that history is only a narrative and one narrative is just as um, has, uh, important or just as acceptable as any other. It is not history. The touchstone of a historical narrative is to what extent it does accommodate something that we call uh, truthfulness or can be called verifiability or refutability or whatever we may call by way of uh, philosophical epistemological standards, history is undoubtedly a critical discipline. And thanks to the post-colonialists, I think we are losing uh, the ability to see history um, in the way in which it has to be seen. And I would say the other uh, disciplines of history, like epigraphy, archaeology, historical geography, etc. And I'm so I'm very happy uh, to have been part of this uh, webinar. And I thank Professor Dilip Chakravarti, Professor uh, Makran Paranjipai, and Dr. Lavanya for uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, and I look forward to the afternoon session. Thank you, thank you, Professor Raghutam. Uh, Lavanya ji, you can also say a word or two, and then uh, well deserved uh, sleep. But I just wanted to say that. <laughs> This end, this concluding portion has been very, very useful, inspiring. I think uh, we have uh, foregrounded some, uh, you know, touchy, even controversial issues, how identity politics has colored the discipline of history. And as Professor Agotam said, you know, the toxicity of some of these narratives, their divisive appeal, uh, and uh, what we can do to remedy this. But I just want to just throw in a cat among the pigeons, so to speak, by saying the very fact that we are acknowledging the, the power, the staying power of these narratives shows that history is not as objective, not as fact-based, not as critical as we would like it to be, not as verifiable, and certainly not as refutable. So with a sketchy uh, storehouse of facts, sometimes, uh, many lacunae, as somebody said, it's a puzzle-solving exercise. And then it's that uh, narrative formation, the skill, uh, uh, you know, in making a story plausible, that takes over. And, and today we only 
what are we seeing all over the world? We are in the midst of varying narrative wars, you see. And uh, in social media, you can see the power of, uh, of these uh, fake narratives, sometimes of, uh, you know, quasi, uh, should I say, uh, substantiated allegations and so forth. So maybe we are in a post-history, post-truth. I didn't bring in Francis uh, Fukuyama and, you know, the end of history at all. But uh, I think uh, I still see that what we are experiencing in India, at least, is a kind of resurgence with academic historians, non-academic historians, like, you know, the leading his historian of Maratha history now is a man called Uday Kulkarni, who is a surgeon who worked for the Air Force. And I've read his books. They're very well documented. I think they can pass muster. And we also have popular historians, William Dalrymple, his history of the East India Company is a history of loot. I mean, it's very beautifully written and it has a wealth of facts and, uh, you know, uh, and insights, I would say. There are histories of the Kohinoor, uh, you know, so I'm just saying that it's a, it's a time of great uh, ferment and, and fervor for Indian history. Lots of people are stepping out, writing. And as I said, there are all kinds of histories, global histories, species histories, century histories, histories of Asia. Another friend of mine has, has written a, a whole history of Asia. You see, he's a Singapore-based uh, uh, based author. It's a very good book in its own ways. And then there are micro-histories, you know, very small things are being written about. Uh, so I think it's a time of, uh, uh, you know, I would say hope. Uh, and uh, possibilities also. And I am enthused by a, uh, a movement, as I see it, and a collaboration and a uh, cooperation between, you know, the diaspora and people here, and not relying entirely on government, uh, private initiatives, foundations like the Vivekanand International Foundation. So all all together, put together, there are, I think, uh, there's a lot going on uh, now. And uh, uh, unfortunately, some disciplines are badly off. I agree, archaeology, uh, epigraphy. Somebody told me only five people can read inscriptions in India. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but things are bad. And I agree in certain disciplines. But at the same time, the tight control of history as a discipline by a few that is breaking down for a variety of reasons. And I hand it to Lavanya ji to conclude this uh, session now. And we'll meet again after lunch at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't have much to add. You have covered everything. Um, we haven't placed importance in history uh, after independence. That's, that's one of the problems we I think the the history was ceded to a small group, and uh, uh, and um, examination of sources was not uh, considered very important. Many of them don't read Sanskrit, don't read inscriptions, so uh, so uh, naturally, <laughs> so they continued the narrative that was already there. You know, if you can read the new sources you can bring out new information if you can't read them of course you're going to continue the same thing so yeah um uh, but i'm glad it's it's beginning to uh, get wide uh, and more uh, more books are written and more uh, narratives are coming out uh, which is actually good for us good for the field of history Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, guiding us and helping us uh, I, and uh, organizing this. So thank you. Thank you. I look forward to everyone rejoining us at 2 o'clock. The session will be chaired by Professor Dilip Chakravarti, and he will have occasion to continue uh, you know, his uh, line of argument, which he has initiated already. Thank you all. And we'll rejoin you later and Lavanyaji tomorrow. Sleep yeah. well. Thanks.
Thank you. Very well deserved rest. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Dilip Chakravarti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.